Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, General, for being here. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I, I read this somewhere. I don't remember who said it, but I wrote it, but I remember it. It was once observed that, that a parent who stops loving their children, if a parent stops loving their children, the children will not stop loving the parent. The children will stop loving themselves. Um, I know we can agree that uh, we should encourage parents to be involved in their kids' lives. Absolutely. And I'm sure we can agree that we should encourage parents to uh, make their kids do their homework. Yes, although there's sometimes some resistance to that. Right, right. And to make sure they get sleep at night so they can be ready for school. Yes. Um, here's what I'm, I've always been confused about. Didn't you understand the chilling effect that it would have to parents when you issued uh, your directive when you directed your criminal divisions and your counterterrorism divisions to, um, to investigate parents who were angry at school boards and administrators during COVID? So, Senator, if you'd just give me a moment to put the full context. I did not do that. I did not issue any memorandum directing the investigation of parents who were concerned about their children. Quite to the contrary, the memorandum that you're talking about says at the very beginning of the memorandum that vigorous public debate is protected by the First Amendment. And the kind of concerns that you're talking about are, uh, as expressed by parents, are of course completely protected. The memorandum was aimed at violence and threats of violence against a whole host of school personnel. It was not aimed at parents making complaints to their school board. And it, it came in the context of a whole series of other kinds of violent threats uh, and violence against other public well, well, officials. Let's walk through this. Um, your directive to your criminal division and your counterterrorism -terror division came in a response to a letter from the National School Boards Association, did it not? In part to the letter and in part to news reports of violence and and, and the, the National School Board Association um, said these parents ought to be investigated under the Patriot Act as potential domestic terrorists. And you'll notice, Senator, that I said nothing like that. I understand, that in but my that's head. what the letter said. There, there was a reference to that in the letter, right. something I disagree with. And your employees helped them write the letter, didn't they? I don't know anything to suggest that that's true. No, I think I don't. it is true. Well, and the White House helped them write that letter, didn't they? I, I, don't, I don't know. I have no knowledge about that, but certainly I don't know anything about my employees and so, helping write that letter. So you get this letter from the National School Board Association asking you to investigate parents that your employees helped write and that the White House helped write, and you issue a directive to your criminal division and to your counterintelligence or counterterrorism division to start investigating parents who are angry. What did you think was going to happen? I'll say again, Senator, that I, my, nothing in my memorandum says to investigate parents who are angry. Quite the opposite. It says that the First Amendment protects that kind of vigorous debate. The only thing we wanted was for an assessment to be made out in the field about whether federal assistance was needed to prevent violence and threats of violence. Well, one of your field, that's not the way your, your, your department implemented your directive. One of your field offices actually opened an investigation. You set up a a website and a hotline to report parents. And yeah, there, I, state, I don't think we didn't set up a specific hotline about this. This was a, a reference to the FBI's hotline. A state Democratic Party official contacted you. They said uh, that some Republicans were inciting violence 
by expressing public displeasure with school districts' vaccine mandates. And one of your field offices opened an investigation, which is a permanent part of their record. I, uh, Senator, I, I don't know anything about the specific thing that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, they, used really to say, they used to say in high school this is going to be on your permanent record. I don't believe there is any such thing um, uh, with respect oh, I, to, the, I think to this. I there is at the FBI general, and oh. you and I both know there is. There, there was a lady and in, in, uh, a mom in Michigan. She has a special needs kid, and the kid was doing pretty well. And she got upset with her local school board over its closures and and uh, virtual learning policies, and she went to the meeting. And, and she made an intemperate comment. She, she, she accused them of being a bunch of Nazis. Um, why would the FBI open an investigation of her? Again, I don't know anything about the specifics of the case, but accusing people of being Nazis, while well, I find bad, is certainly not criminal. It's totally protected no. by the First Amendment. I mean, I and I've said that over and over again. This is not the first time we've discussed not, this. That's not what your department did. Well, I, 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 this is about the third time I've been asked to say about the same memorandum. And each time I've said, and I hope that the senators would go ahead and advise their constituents in the same way, that this is not what we do. We are not in any way trying to interfere with parents making complaints but, but, about the education of their children. But don't you understand, General, and, 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 and I, I, I believe you, but don't you understand that this looks like you were just giving in to the teachers' unions and politicizing the disagreement, the honest disagreements? I mean, we only, as a result of some of our school board policies, we only experienced the largest learning loss for our kids in modern history. Don't you think parents had a right to be upset? Absolutely. Instead of, what is a, I mean, you, you implemented, what's a threat tag? Uh, I didn't implement the threat tag. What you're talking about there is a, a part of uh, internal FBI operations. Yeah. So, you, as far you, as I, I can. You directed your folks, though, to open threat tags on these parents I, I and, and, and investigate them. Yeah, I did not uh, uh, direct that. My understanding from testimony by the FBI is that when somebody makes a complaint and it involves, uh, a, 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 if somebody uh, gives a tip that a, a, a school official is being threatened, then there's, uh, in order to uh, 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 look at trends, they mark it as a as a uh, uh, tip involving a school official. They make the, have the same set of uh, threat tags with respect to a complaint that suggests somebody is making a threat against a Supreme Court justice. These aren't complaints. These are tips that of violence or threats of violence. A threat tag on a parent for being concerned at a school board meeting. It's not on the parent. It's not on whoever. It's on uh, to indicate that a threat was made against, or at least alleged that a threat was made against, a school board member or a school official or a teacher or a school. Some of these turned out to be bomb threats. Senator, so, uh, Senator Kennedy, we're going to have a second round of questioning on behalf of I uh, Chairman Durbin, who has gone to vote. I'm going to call on. Uh, you're, you're blaming it on Durbin, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I apologize for I going over. I take full responsibility. Thank you, General. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for being here. Thank you for to you and your team for helping to save the economy during the pandemic meltdown. Um, for what it's worth, I'm generally supportive of the actions of the Fed right now, and I, I'm not going to ask you to that today to blame anybody. Um, when Congress spends money, it stimulates the economy, does it not? Well, it, it would depend on whether that's funded by tax increases or not. But, so if there's a spending that's, that's not accompanied by taxes would have a net at the margin stimulative effect. Well, and when Congress borrows money to spend even more, that stimulates the economy even more, does it not? At the margin, yeah. Okay. If Congress reduced 
the rate of growth in its spending and reduced the rate of growth in its debt accumulation, it, it would make your job easier in reducing inflation, would it not? It, I don't think fiscal policy right now is a big factor driving inflation at this moment, uh, but it's absolutely essential that we do uh, slow the pace of growth, particularly for the areas of the budget. All right, let's try growing. to unpack this then. <clears throat> I'm not trying to trick you. You're raising interest rates. You're raising interest rates to slow the economy, are you not? Yes, to cool the economy off. Um, and one of the ways you measure your success, other than fluctuation in gross domestic product, is the unemployment rate. Is it not? Yes, one of the measures. Okay. So in effect, this, I'm not being critical. When you're slowing the economy, you're trying to put people out of work. That's your job, is it not? Not really. We're trying to we're trying to restore price stability. No, um, you're trying to, you're trying to raise not, not the wages. you're trying to raise the unemployment rate. There are and, a lot, so there are a lot me, of that me. I know you don't like the phrase, so let me strike it. You're trying to raise the unemployment rate, are you not? No, we're not trying to raise it. We're trying to realign supply and demand, which could happen through a bunch of channels. Like for example, uh, you know, just job openings. All job right, let openings. Me, let could, me put it another way. Okay. The economists did a, did a wonderful study. They looked at, at, at 10 disinflationary periods in America going all the way back to the 1950s. Disinflation is what you're trying to do. It's a slowing in the rate of inflation. Am I right? Yes. In other words, prices don't go down. They just don't go up as fast. Deflation is when prices actually go down. You're trying to achieve disinflation, are you not? Yes, we are. Okay. Based on history, in the 10 times that we got inflation down, disinflation since the 1950s, in order to reduce inflation by 2%, unemployment had to go up 3.6%. Now, that's history, is it not? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but yes, the standard has been that there have been recessions and downturns when okay. the Fed has tried to reduce inflation. Now, right now, the, the current inflation rate is 6.4%, and the current unemployment rate is 3.4%. Now, if history is right, I'm not asking you to, 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 again, blame anybody, but if history is right, unless you get some help, in order to get inflation down from 6.4%, to let's say 4.4 percent, and the unemployment rate is going to have to rise to 7 percent based on history. That's what the record would say. Okay, and to get inflation down to 2.2 percent, based on history, an immutable fact, unemployment would have to go to 10.6 percent. Would it not? No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. That's uh, what the record. Show, that's what the history shows. Yeah. And I, I don't think that kind of a number is, is at all in play I mean, here. I, I know you're reluctant to admit it, and you don't want to get in the middle of a policy uh, dispute. But I think it's undeniable. It's undeniable that the only way we're going to get this sticky inflation down is to attack it on the monetary side, which you're doing, and on the fiscal side, which means Congress has got to reduce the rate of growth of spending and reduce, reduce the rate of growth of, of debt accumulation. Now, I get that you don't want to get in the middle of that fight. But the more we help on the fiscal side, the fewer people you're going to have to put out of work. Isn't that a fact? Please answer. Good work out there, right? Okay. Sir? It uh, could work out that way. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Senator Kennedy. Senator Reed of Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Kennedy is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, and I'm going to call you Madam you Secretary. You gave me a promotion. Thank you so no, much. No, I didn't. I'm, I'm intentionally <laughs> calling you Madam Secretary because you have cabinet-level status. And uh, uh, you're also from Louisiana, which I'm very proud of. So we claim you as our secretary. Um, does it embarrass you? And I know it must because it embarrasses me. This is not a loaded question. That the federal government continues, as we have for a while, 
to check to send money to dead people, and you, they cash the checks. You and I have talked about this um, a couple of years ago, and yeah. it, of course, of course, we should yeah. not. That should not be happening. Well, here's what I'm hoping that that the, the administration will take a look at during the stimulus uh, uh, period when we we're trying to keep our society on its feet, we sent out checks to 1.4, one, we sent out $1.4 billion worth of checks to dead people. And they were cashed, obviously fraud. And as best I can tell, we don't know from sure, for sure, but we sent out between $1 and $2 billion of checks a year, continuously, to dead people. And they're cashed, obviously fraud. We passed a bill that, that said Social Security, which gets the information about who's alive and who's dead from the states, has got to talk to the Department of Treasury to make sure that its do not pay list includes people who are dead. Um, it, it, was, it, it was a shame we had to pass a bill to, 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 uh, to implement common sense, but nonetheless we did it. But in order to get the bill passed, I had to make some compromises. I can't imagine anybody would be against it. We're going to start doing that on December 23rd of this year, but it's only for three years. Mm -hmm. And the Government Accounting Office wants to, says we ought to make it permanent. And I'm going to try to make it permanent. Um, and I really wish, I'm not going to ask you today because I know you have to talk to the President, but if you could talk to the president and, and try to get a commitment to let's pass. I will. One of the things that was shocking to me is Treasury uh, in the last administration and, and this list from Social Security had to develop an MOU uh, to even share this database. Uh, and you would think it would be easy uh, to do that. So uh, I I'm, uh, support you. I'd also ask you uh, to work with us. We have a, a fraud proposal uh, in the budget Happy to. Uh, that... Uh, make sure IGs have what they need. Uh, make sure we go after fraud in the UI system. Um, where we saw transnational crime syndicates, frankly, uh, take advantage of the system. So I'd love to work with you on that as well. Yeah. The, the, another area I, I, I'm hoping the administration will look at, we're spending a lot of money to, um, to, to um, send pharmaceutical drugs to certain hospitals. Um, at really, really low prices. The idea being, of course, that those hospitals will pass that savings on to people who, who, uh, who are less fortunate economically than you and me. Mm -hmm. There's just one problem. There's no requirement that the hospitals do that. And some of those hospitals, I think it's, it's called the 340B program, some of those hospitals are going, thank you very much, federal government, for, for giving me these cheap drugs, and they're turning around because dollars are fungible and basically selling those drugs for a profit to paying patients. And we're spending billions on this. It makes no sense, Madam Secretary. I really wish y'all would take a look at that. Happy to. We just had a long discussion about health care costs. Um, and I'm happy to work with you and your office um, on this and, and uh, bring in HHS and CMS to the conversation. Okay. My last question, um, I know I, I listened to one of the president's press conferences, and, and he said, um, he said uh, you know, no, no, nobody, no middle-income people uh, are going to have to pay any of this $4.7 trillion worth of new taxes. Is that really accurate? I mean, isn't, isn't the administration proposing in its budget to roll back uh, some of the provisions, many of the provisions of the 2017 Tax Cuts and no, Jobs sir. Act? No, sir. So but, you're not, you're not uh, arguing that we should roll them back? Uh, we are very clearly in the budget state that the president would support extending uh, those tax cuts for those making under four hundred thousand. Now he does believe. Yeah, but, but we but, should pay but, for those. Yeah, uh, but, by but but he's proposing to roll back tax cuts for people who are making less than four hundred thousand, isn't he? No, sir. I think he's he saying he's saying the Trump tax cuts, as we call them, uh, ex expire in twenty twenty five. So the twenty four budget does not. Some make of them in. expire sooner. Some of them expire sooner, like the R and D tax credit. 
Um, and I know there are various proposals uh, in the Senate to extend mm -hmm. those. Um, but on individual taxes, the president uh, in black and white says he would support extending those. He would not support raising taxes on anyone under 400000 but he thinks uh, those over 400000 uh, ensuring that those are rolled back to pay for lower income, those under 400000 should be on the tables. So we can I, do I that in a fiscally and, responsible and I agree way. that's what he said. I just don't think that's what his budget does. Thank you, Madam, okay. Madam Secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Come visit us in Louisiana. Come back I'm to I'm always there. Get out of D.C. Come back to America. <laughs> Senator Graham. Thank you, uh, Senator Heinrich. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, uh, welcome, Madam Secretary. Thank you. Madam Senator. Secretary, isn't it a fact that the president's proposed budget for next fiscal year is a half a trillion dollars more than this fiscal year? That he, on the spending side. Yes. That's what a budget is. Yeah. It, it, it is about, about $400 billion. It's about $500 billion more, more, right? It's about what? $500 billion more, right? About that. Isn't it a fact that uh, since 2019 until today, I'm not including the extra $500 billion that y'all want to spend. Since 2019 through today, U.S. population is, has increased 1.8 percent, and the federal government's budget is up 55 percent. Isn't that a fact? Well, we had a pandemic. Isn't that a fact, though? Are my numbers I'm not right? I, I don't know those numbers. You don't know? You never uh, looked at that? I, I don't have those numbers in my head. I, I'm not disputing them. Okay. Um, isn't it a fact that the president's proposed budget proposes $4.7 trillion in new taxes? It does, it does propose significant additional taxes, yes. $4.7 trillion? Something like that, yes. Okay. You talked about reducing deficit. Isn't it a fact that under President Biden's proposed budget, that gross debt will rise from $32.7 trillion at the close of this year to $51 trillion by 2033? Do, I'm sorry, what number did you give me for? Uh, the president's proposed budget will increase gross debt from $33 trillion at the close of this year to $51 trillion in 2033. Isn't that well, correct? Well, debt held, held by the public, which is... No, ma'am, that's gross debt. Isn't that a fact? That's probably a fact. So you haven't reduced the deficit, have you? The, uh, the deficit, the debt and deficits are reduced by how, the president's how, 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 budget. How can you go from $33 trillion because, to fifty? Because $1 trillion dollars and call that a reduction in the deficit. Be, because that's a calculation for which you need a baseline, and then you compare the budget and the deficits in debt in the budget with a baseline in which there are no cha none of the changes, either in revenues or in spending, okay. That are proposed Here's my baseline. In the budget. Here's my baseline. At the end of this year, we project people a lot smarter than me, probably not than you, but smarter than me, say that uh, gross debt's 33 trillion. They say if the president's budget is implemented by 2033, it'll be 51 trillion dollars. Isn't if, that a fact? If the president's budget is not implemented and none of the changes are made, it will be worse than that. And so the president's budget has improved the fiscal outlook relative to um, what we would have without the president's proposals. E even though he, it raises uh, gross debt from $33 trillion to $51 trillion, you say that's an improvement? It is, it is an improvement because it raises taxes by more, and um, it leads to— that's, That includes taxes. In what world is that an improvement? 
other than Washington and Long and Long, Long Land. It, it's an improvement in that the te the revenue increases far act exceed proposed investments. Okay. All right. Let me ask you this: Isn't it a fact that uh, in Feb in January of 2019, the Federal Reserve issued a warning to Silicon Valley Bank over its over its risk management systems? I have no idea. I'm not responsible in any way. You but you're in charge of the banking bailouts and the crisis, right? I, I, I am not involved in banking supervision, and I don't have access to any information about the supervision of Silicon Valley Bank. Okay, so you don't know whether or not the Fed, you haven't looked to see whether or not the Fed issued a, a warning, what, four years ago? to the bank over the, its risk management systems? That's not public information, and it's sure not it is. information. It's in the Wall Street Journal. Well, it may be in the Wall Street Journal, but it's not public information, and it's not information that I have access to. Well, I'll give you a copy of this article. The I've Fed read the article, but... The um, Fed issued a matter requiring attention, and it said your, your, your risk management practices are terrible, and you need to improve them. That is what the article says. Right. Um, isn't it a fact that uh, months before SVB went under that uh, the bank disclosed that the, the, its mark-to-market value of its, of its bonds was $16 billion less than their balance sheet value? They, they did make such a statement. Yeah. Did the people at the Federal Reserve just not read it? I'm not at the Federal Reserve. I know. I was at the Federal Reserve. But you're at the Treasury, and you're in charge of the banking crisis. Let me I, ask you. Let me I ask am you. not in charge of the supervision of the bank. Let me ask you this. Um, Senator Hunter talked about the uh, 2018 amendments to the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, it, isn't it a fact? Now, now SVB was not stress-tested in 2022. 34 banks were. Here's the Fed's report. Isn't it a fact that if SVB had been stress-tested, it would have passed? Stress tests look at capital of a bank. Here's the, 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 the yes, ma'am, under, under the stress test. Isn't it a fact that SVB would have, would have passed? I don't know. I it wasn't stressed. Yeah, you need to look into that, Madam Secretary. I, that's this is not my job. This is the Federal Reserve's job. Okay, isn't it a fact that when the Federal Reserve stress tested in 2022, it only stress tested credit risk. It didn't stress test duration risk. Isn't that a fact? You know, I believe the stress tests in general partially address and take account of interest rate No, ma'am. I've read it. Here it is. Bigger than Dallas. Well, to the extent that there are assets held in an available for sale portfolio that would suffer losses um, due, to in, due to changing interest rates, um, <clears throat> that would be captured in the bank's No, ma'am. It's not there. I've read it. Senator Kennedy, I've um, I've allowed people to uh, the secretary to stray over answer. Kennedy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary. How are you babies? Thank you for asking. They're doing all right. As we were talking about earlier, my father used to tell me, you'll never know love until you have a child. <laughs> It's a different kind of love. Secretary. It is a different a, kind of love. It's a wonderful thing. I want to ask you a, a, a philosophical question, Mr. Secretary. Hmm. How you and your team go about deciding whether to promulgate a new rule? Hmm. Let me give you an example. Study after study um, has shown that the number of teenagers you have in a car is directly proportional to their chance of having a wreck. Mm. Um, and, and we've known this for years. 
I'm not recommending this rule because, frankly, I don't know how I'd vote on it if it came to us. But suppose one of your team members came to you and said, look, if, if we promulgate a rule that you can't have, if you have a teenage driver, you can't have more, any other teenagers in the car with that teenage driver. How would you go about analyzing that? Well, in this type of case, it would likely reflect the traditional division of labor that we've had between the federal government and the states, in that the federal government tends to regulate the design of a vehicle, uh, the design of the roads, uh, and safety issues related to that physical infrastructure and the physical vehicle, while state DMVs and state laws tend to regulate the conduct of a driver. So the very thing you're mentioning, for example, I think is why in some states there's a gradual approach where when you have your learner's permit, you can be behind the wheel, uh, but there are restrictions on who could be in the vehicle with you for exactly that reason. I know you're asking this philosophically and not in terms of the particular policy that you're, uh, that you're using as an illustration, but to zoom out more generally, we would look, as my answer up to now might indicate, at our authorities and our responsibilities. We'd look at the data and where it leads us. We'd look at what we think is likely to happen if we were to promulgate a rule like that. And then, of course, we'd get a lot of feedback. Uh, we would make sure that uh, we have an understanding of what uh, uh, the, the different stakeholders think is important, uh, information we might not be privy to. Now, having said all of that, the truth is it's rarely the case that we imagine a rule and go out into a universe as a blank state, a slate and find out what might happen around it. Usually there has been dialogue, debate, and data building up for years that makes a potential rule rise higher on the list of a department that can only take so many regulatory steps at a time. And of course is also working to revise and occasionally withdraw older rules that are still on the books. But hopefully that gives you some sense of the approach that we would take and that we do take when we're thinking about our rulemaking authorities. Okay. Um, I want to get in one other question while I have time. In uh, fiscal year 2021 in our appropriations bill, uh, we, we, uh, we created, we meaning Congress, a National Center of Excellence for Liquefied Natural Gas Safety. Um, and the, the, uh, the statute I'll just quote it to you, it's short. Quote, in determining, this is what the statute says, in determining the location of the center, the secretary shall, not may, but shall, locate the center in the state with the largest LNG production capacity as determined by the total capacity in billion cubic feet per day of LNG production authorized by the federal Energy Regulatory Commission under Section 3 of the Natural Gas Act as of the date of enactment of this act. That's Louisiana. Louisiana has a production capacity of 21.2 billion cubic feet a day. Your, uh, your Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration uh, doesn't seem to want to locate the center in our state, my state. Can you tell me why, if you know? I'll have to consult with the, the Pipeline and Hazardous Safety and Material Administration to understand the latest on that center of excellence, but I can certainly uh, tell you that uh, we, of course, ensure any choice we make is conforming with statute, and so I want to make sure that uh, whatever is underway is consistent with, uh, uh, with the law as written. I, if you would look at it, I, I know you have a lot of things on your plate, but the law is pretty clear, hmm. and uh, um, personal preference is not supposed to enter into this, and, and I think my state is clearly uh, number one in production capacity, and, and I've noticed a, a uh, determined reluctance by, by some of your, your agency folks to make this decision and put it in my state. Now, I'd much rather just have them, have them be up front and tell me why. I'll make sure to find out. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Secretary, do you agree with the President 
that we should ban the private ownership of assault weapons in America? Senator, I do. What is an assault weapon? It is, for example, in an AK-47. Uh, can you give me a definition other than just pointing to a specific weapon? Would there be other weapons besides an AK-47 you would ban? Uh, there uh, uh, very well are. And I remember when I was a federal prosecutor uh, in the Central District of California from September 25th, 1989 to, I believe it was April 2001. And I thank you for uh, your service, the, but if you could answer law my question. The, the vast majority of law enforcement officers, uh, leaders uh, with whom I worked uh, uh, were uh, greatly in support of the assault weapons Mr. ban. Mr. Chairman, you know why we get so frustrated with you? Because you won't give straight answers. I think I just did. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Do you have an, a, def, a definition of an assault weapon? Uh, I am confident there is a technical definition of what is an assault weapon, uh, and it was uh, assuredly used uh, in the context of the statute that previously existed banning assault weapons. Um, Mr. Mr. Secretary, our, our southern border is not secure, is it? Senator, um, I have spoken about this. I believe I've addressed this earlier in the hearing. Why don't you let address me, it again? Of course. Let me, uh, let me share with you um, a few things. Number one, when I speak of the security of the border, I am speaking of maximizing the resources we have to deliver the most effective results. So and we, let me we, assure we, you we, that we are doing We are secure so. because we're trying to secure it. Are we succeeding? Uh, Senator, we are so focused on the security of our southern border. We are doing so much with but, respect but you're not to succeeding. the surge of how, personnel. How are, how are, you're not succeeding. Oh, Senator, let me share with you that the challenge of migration that we are experiencing at our southern border is not exclusive to the United States. It is something that is gripping the entire hemisphere. But my job is to worry about the United States. Mr. As is Chairman. mine. As and, is mine. And here's my question. Let me try to rephrase it. And I really do wish, I understand the position you're in, but you really should try to do a better job of answering the questions. Um, under the Biden administration, we have the most encounters, we have had the most encounters with people attempting to come into our country illegally in the history of ever. Under the Biden administration, we have had the most people entering our country illegally in the history of ever. Under the Biden administration, we have had the most uh, gotaways at our southern border in the history of ever. Uh, under the Biden administration, we have had the most number of people entering our country under a claim of asylum, having that claim turned down and still not being deported in the history of ever. And under the Biden administration, we've had the most fentanyl coming into our country in the history, history of ever. How can you possibly say the southern border is secure? Do you know I that, understand you, you, your answer that you're trying, but I'm not asking about your efforts. I'm asking about the results. Well, let's talk about the results then, Senator. Do you know that um, last year we expelled and removed approximately 1.4 million uh, people from the southern border? I, th I believe that's the most ever. Do you realize uh, that we are focused on enforcing our laws to achieve the security of the southern border? I, I know you're focused, Mr. Chairman, but you're, or Mr. Secretary, but you're not succeeding. Uh, Senator, and I just... And when you come testify to us, you talk about how you're trying really hard and, and I don't have any way to disprove that. I, I, I accept that statement in good faith. But the numbers belie that. Let, let, if I can, Senator, let me give you an example uh, of a solution that we uh, have delivered that um, for some reason is being I, contested. I, I, Mr. No, no, because Mr. it's, it's caused the 95... I, I give you 30 seconds, okay? It's, don't, it's caused don't, the 95... Don't, don't filibuster me. It's You've caused, been doing that all day. I'm just trying to ask I'm just you trying questions. to communicate. It has, it has led to a approximately 95% drop 
in the number of encounters in between the ports of entry at our southern border of Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans. Mr. Secretary. On January 5th. Mr. And why Secretary. would that be opposed when it is delivering precisely the result that you seek? Did you just parachute in from another planet, Mr. Secretary? Because you're the only person in the Milky Way who believes that we're not having massive, massive illegal immigration into America. Senator, you're, you're, um, you're putting words into my mouth. No, sir, there is, I'm there accurately is, describing the situation. There is no question, there is no question that we have a very serious challenge at our southern border. Okay. It let is me, a let challenge. Me, well, I, is we can agree on that. Let me ask you another question. Um, why don't you just declare a new policy that other than children, if you present at the southern border, you claim refugee status, you claim political asylum, and you haven't claimed refugee status and political asylum at the first safe country, then you can't come in. Um, uh, Senator, so first of all, when one presents at the border, it's an asylum claim. Not but why don't you do that? Why don't you just unilaterally claim. declare that it, a, a safe third country policy? It would work. You can't come into America. If you're coming from Venezuela and you come through Mexico, if you didn't claim asylum in Mexico, you can't come here. You have to leave. Why don't you just do that? Well, uh, Senator, uh, let me give you an example with respect to Mexico. A safe third country agreement uh, let's hypothetically you assume... You don't have to have an agreement with Mexico. Yes, you do. No, you don't. I believe you do, Senator. No, you don't. I'll have Other to... countries don't do it. Just adopt a policy that says, except for children, because you don't want to send children back by themselves. Just adopt a new policy that if, if, you, if you didn't seek asylum in the first, safe third country, you can't come in, period. Uh, Senator, are you aware of the notice of proposed rulemaking that we issued, the comment period of which closed yesterday. You've which, had two years to adopt a policy. Like I just described, why haven't you done it? So, Senator, what we have done is... It, but we why have, have you done, haven't you done that? We have surged enforcement resources. We have well, why developed... Why haven't you just adopted... Please, if you would, Mr. Secretary, answer my question. It is my understanding... Why haven't you, why haven't you adopted unilaterally a safe third country policy? That would stop, except for children, all the folks from the Northern Triangle countries, all the folks from Venezuela, all the folks from Cuba, all the folks from the Middle East from coming into our country. Why haven't you done that? Uh, Senator, it's my understanding that those, two things, it is my understanding that those agreements do require uh, you the You don't have to have an agreement, agreement with anybody. It can be a policy established by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Senator, uh, I'd have to uh, review the. You legal haven't reviewed that. You haven't considered that possibility. Let me let me finish, if I may. Sure. Um, I would have to review the under uh, the legal underpinnings of your. Well, assertion. you better get reviewing. And I also, you ought to get not, reviewing. You're, this is the first time that's occurred to you. I also do not think that that is sound policy. You don't think that's that. This is the first time that's occurred to you. I also do not think that that is sound policy that we should shut down our entire asylum system. I didn't say shut down the entire asylum system. I, I, I said safe third country. All you have to do, Mr. Secretary, if you're really serious, and it's beginning, frankly, to appear that you're not, is adopt a policy that says we're not, we're not seeking anyone's agreement. We don't have to. If you're coming from a, another country, and you come through, let's say, Mexico, and you say you're, you're, you're seeking asylum, you have to seek it in Mexico or the other first safe third country, or you can't come in. Period. Done. End of story. Why don't you do that? Uh, uh, Senator, um, uh, I don't think that we have the unilateral authority. Sure you do. Other uh, countries do Number one do and it. number two, as have I mentioned. Have you tried sneaking into China? As I've mentioned, I do not think that is sound policy. Why? Uh, because you are basically shutting down our asylum system. No, you're least. not. You're saying we, we respect, we honor your right to seek political asylum, but but you, you're cherry picking. Do it in Mexico first. 
Why, why haven't you done that? I, I've, I, I think I've addressed that issue, Senator. You don't want to do it, Mr. Secretary. That's what it's beginning to look like, because you think our borders ought to be open, and it would be more intellectually honest if you just say that. That is false. I, I don't agree with you. You have to watch up here what people do, not what they say, and everything else is just cottage cheese. Uh, Senator, I don't think Thank I you, don't Mr. think that 1.4 million people who were expelled or removed last year would consider the border open. Mr. Chairman, you've had, or Mr. Secretary, you've had billions, uh, millions coming into the country illegally. The most of the history of ever under your watch. And everybody knows that, apparently, except you. Either that or you're not being forthcoming with We've also had the largest number of individuals expelled or removed from the southern border. And if one takes a look at the apprehension uh, and encounter uh, numbers, uh, and then the removal uh, numbers, one would have a different uh, view. If you do the safe third country policy, that'll solve half of your problem right there. Thank and you, you're Senator. not denying anybody asylum. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Ossoff. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Senator Schatz. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Thank you, General, for being here. Um, General, I want to ask you about the shooting at Covenant School, which is part of the Covenant Presbyterian Church. I, I realize that the shooter is dead, but the shooter could have had collaborators. Do you plan on, on opening a hate crime investigation for the targeting of Christians? The um, FBI and ATF are both uh, on the scene working with the um, uh, local police. Uh, as of now, motive hasn't been identified, and the police chief said at the last, at his last press conference that they don't yet have reached a conclusion with respect to uh, motive. Uh, we are certainly working full time with them to try and determine what the motive is, and of course motive is what determines whether it's a hate crime or not. Okay, okay. Um, FBI Director Ray couldn't answer this at the time for reasons that are not his fault, but... Um, I hope you'll say the same thing if I can't answer it. Right? <laughs> well, I think the coast is clear now. Um, Michael Sussman, you know who I'm talking about? Uh, he, he was a defendant in a special counsel uh, uh, prosecution. Case. Right, right. He was with the private law firm Perkins Coey, uh, which is the main counsel for the uh, National Democratic Party. He had a special badge to get him into the uh, Justice Department and or the FBI building. Why did he have that special badge? Uh, I'm afraid I also don't know anything about this. I assume uh, from um, the reference that this is something that Mr. Durham was investigating as part of his investigation. No, I don't think he investigated the badge. Uh, I know he was investigating Mr. Sussman. This goes back to, I think, 2020. Right. Um, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Could you find out for me? At the time, the, tri the, the, the trial was in progress, and Mr. Ray couldn't answer, but the trial's over. And I'd like to know why Mr. Sussman, a private citizen, had a special badge to get him into the FBI and the Department of Justice, and if there are other people out there who have special badges. Um, well, on, on the particular question about Sussman, I think we're going to have to wait until uh, Mr. Durham uh, finishes his report, which should be relatively s soon. I certainly don't in any way want to interfere with him, and he's the one who would know the answer to that. On the more general question, I can certainly ask my team to look into how lawyers have special badges. Would you? That'd be great. Thank you. I want to ask you about uh, the China Initiative. Uh, which, as you know, was started under the Department of Justice to counter the transfer of scientific research and intellectual property to, um, to China. Um, at any time, did the investigations initiated under the China Initiative uh, by the Department of Justice stem from racism? I have no evidence to suggest that they did. Okay. At any time, did the investigations pursuant to 
the China Initiative and begun by the Department of Justice. Um, were they ever inappropriately undertaken? Again, I, I have no evidence to suggest that they did. Obviously, some of the cases resulted in acquittals or dismissals by court, but the courts, but that doesn't mean that they were uh, inappropriately begun. Okay. Um, did any of the cases that the department initiated under the China initiative um, um, reflect the ancestry of the defendant charged more than the seriousness of the allegations? I'm not, not sure exactly what you're asking, but it, it sounds like it's the same question and I would give the same answer. I don't have any reason to believe that anything was in, done inappropriately or based on ancestry or based on discrimination in those cases. Okay. Do you agree with Chris Ray that China is the biggest threat to U.S. security? Yeah, I, uh, and I think the Director of National Intelligence also testified that it's our okay. uh, most dangerous uh, um, uh, near peer. Well, well, let me ask you this, because I've got 11 seconds. I'm sorry? I've got 11 seconds left. Why did you get rid of the China Initiative then? Yeah, so um, as you know, um, the uh, the new Assistant Attorney General uh, for the uh, National Security uh, uh, Division uh, gave a long description of what was done. Um, this was all folded into one uh, uh, nation state initiative. Uh, we don't know sometimes when there's a cyber attack, when there's another kind of attack, which country is attacking us. And I believe he thought it was most efficient for us to focus our attention on the four main uh, hostile uh, state actors. China now in, in, in many ways uh, affiliating with Russia. Which S some of your people it. said it was racist. I, I, I didn't say that. I don't know who my people are who said that. Okay. Well, if I had more time, I, we, can, we can find out here. <laughs> Help me out, Senator Manchin. <laughs> um, Senator Kennedy, there will be a second round of yes, questions if yes, you would like to stay. Yes, ma'am. Senator Manchin. There's no way I could fill in for you, sir. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know what... Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Madam Chair, um, I, I'm glad to see us returning on the Appropriations Committee to uh, qu what I'll call quasi-regular order, where our subcommittees are, are meeting and, and talking about the matters within our jurisdiction. Um, and I think we should return to full regular order. I think whether we return to full regular order will depend on Senator Schumer. Uh, I'm not convinced yet that he will allow us to return to full regular order. I'm not convinced yet that he will give up his power to uh, basically write the budget, he and a few other leaders. And uh, I'm not convinced, well, I don't want to necessarily ascribe this to to uh, Chuck, many people like an omnibus because they can hide the spending and because they have enough internal power to get what they want and uh, for everybody else it's too bad. So um, I hope that we'll all encourage Senator Schumer to actually bring the, the, uh, the, 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 the bills to the floor because that's going to be the true test. We can all meet and have all, ask all these questions and pour over budgets that never have a chance to pass. It's going to depend on Senator Schumer, and that's kind of the bottom line. Mr. Secretary, yesterday um, you testified in judiciary that you support an assault weapon ban, and we didn't have much time to talk about that. Um, tell me your definition once more of an assault weapon. Um, uh, Senator, we did indeed um, have a brief exchange on, on that very important, uh, very important subject. I am not an expert. Right. With respect to the definition but, of the assault bans, and so I defer. You to, are the Secretary of Homeland Security. I, I, as as I um, 
uh, I was about to say, I defer to the experts. Uh, I defer to, uh, for example, the definition of a, uh, an assault a weapon that was codified in the prior iteration of the legislation that was passed and uh, that um, uh, was in operation when I served as an, ass an assistant United States attorney and the United States attorney in the Central District of California. So you would support the prior definition under... Uh, Senator, I, I, I must defer to the experts with respect to the definition, uh, but I will tell you, for example, mil military-style weapons are of tremendous concern. We are seeing a tr um, too much devastation. How do you define... But, I mean, you, 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 you personally think we should ban assault weapons, and I, I, I know you to be an intelligent man and a thinking person, so I, I know you've thought about it. What is it about a military... What do you mean by military-style weapon? Um, uh, Senator, um, I really must, must say that you are probing a very, very important area definitionally, definitionally uh, in which I do not have the requisite uh, expertise. I will say this. I will say this. When we see, when we see the tragedy in Nashville, and it is not the first such tragedy that we see, when I engage with my international counterparts and they ask me almost invariably first what is going on with all the mass killings in the United States and why are these assault weapons yes, um, disseminated so broadly, I say that we need legislation to well, ban let me Let me follow up on that. So you support an assault weapon ban, but you don't have a definition. Is that right? Uh, Senator, uh, I, I think that um, you understand where I stand. No, I don't. I don't. You made a very bold statement, very uh, firmly, saying we should ban all assault weapons. And all I'm asking is what, in your mind, is an assault weapon? I mean, you say it's military style. Does that mean it looks like a military weapon? Uh, Senator, I, I believe I've addressed uh, your question. I mean, what, what if it's if a may, what if it's I, I a think, single shot twenty two that looks like a military weapon? Would you ban that because it's scary looking to you, Senator? I think I've addressed um, your question to the best of my abilities. But but you haven't. I mean, I'm trying to understand. You're Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, and as is your right as an American, you believe we should ban assault weapons. But it bothers me. You can't tell me what you would ban. Senator, I would be very pleased to speak with experts and um, uh, confer with you subsequent to today's hearing and share with you a proposed definition that could be inserted into the legislation that is so desperately needed. But, because I will tell you, the, w the but, way but, I look but, at but, it but, but, is Mr. I Secretary, so what, what if tragedy. What if Senator Tester, my good friend, he's not here, what if Senator Tester said to you, I oppose illegal immigration, which I think he does, and you said to him, what, what do you mean by illegal immigration? And he said, well, I don't know, but I oppose it. You wouldn't accept that answer, and that's the answer you've given me. You, you, you said you want to oppose all assault weapons, but you don't know what they are. Can you give me an example? Senator, I think I gave you an example yesterday, so I'm not exactly sure why you're posing Which the one? Question. Refresh my memory, the example. Uh, I believe I, I said uh, an AK-47. Well, what is it about an AK-47 that you, you find to, to be objectionable? Is it, is it the fact that it has a magazine? Senator... Um, Do you know what a magazine is? Uh, Senator... Um, but first, do, I, you, do you know what a magazine is, Mr. Uh, Secretary? Yes, I do. And, Senator, um, uh, what I've, I've come to, to, uh, to do is testify uh, to this uh, committee um, and not take an examination uh, uh, with respect to questions that I've already answered to the best of my ability. And so um, I think it is self-evident why an AK-47 should be banned as just one example. But I look forward to conferring it, it, with you. Except you can't explain what one is. 
I think, um, Senator, that Senator's we have. time has expired. Senator, we've seen enough tragedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So let me ask Dr. Bernstein a question. Doc, why did you think inflation was temporary? The word, of course, transitory is what you're referring to. And I, I, I not only believe, but I've said, and this is... Well, is temporary and transitory, those are synonymous, right? Yeah, those are they're, they're synonyms. And okay, I think well, the, tell me why... But I think transitory no, was... Tell me why you thought inflation... I'm going to be accurate. Why, why in, in your infinite wisdom, you thought inflation was, was uh, transitory or temporary? Well, let me be clear about what we meant at, at the time. And by the way, um, and this is contrary to uh, what uh, uh, Ranking Member Scott said earlier, um, I did not ever say that people didn't understand transitory. What I said was we didn't understand transitory. In fact, well, that's clear. The, we can the, stipulate the, to that. That word uh, mean that word is temporally ambiguous. It meant different things to, to some people. It meant two weeks. To some people, it meant two years. What we meant, and let me answer your question. We thought inflation was going to accelerate and gradually cool down over time. Now that has turned out to be. Uh, in fact, the pattern that inflation has taken. But transitory was much too ambiguous a description of that dynamic. Acceleration, cooling. So, so let me now, stop inflation you, is I'm down from 9% to 5%. Time. You're, are you telling me that when you said inflation was, in tra was transitory, you were correct? Uh, no, I, uh, I'm not saying I was correct or incorrect. What I'm saying was that Sounds was an like ambiguous... you're saying you were correct. Uh, no, I'm saying that that was an ambiguous and unclear word that was uh, poorly chosen, I think, for uh, that discussion because it meant different things to different people. To me... Well, has it been transitory? Us, inflation yeah. has, in fact, behaved much as I just described. We thought inflation was going to accelerate and but, gradually but cool over time. And that is Chair's going to cut assessment. me off. Has it been transitory? Inflation has accelerated and cooled. Senator's time's expired. I want to fulfill what you said, that I was going to cut you off. Yeah. Uh, so you're and Holland and Maryland's recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to, to all of you on your, your nomination. Thank you, Senator Murray. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Administrator, welcome. Nice thank to you. see you again. Thank you, Senator. I, I want to talk to you for a second about something that I know you know a lot about, the Mishu Assembly Facility. And thank you for visiting, Bill. We really appreciate you coming out there. I think you came out uh, late in 2021. As you know, this is an 800-acre facility in New Orleans East and employs about 4,000 people. It's 20 public and private entities. And ba among other things, Mishu, Mishu, assembly facility is the formal name. Mishu makes the rocket that will take the Orion spacecraft to the moon and to Mars. Um, we had a rough few years there when we were hit by two hurricanes and a flood. And uh, our roof was practically demolished. And and NASA has supported, and I'm grateful for that, the money to get the roof repaired. And we're making progress. I was out there a few months ago. But, Mr. Administrator, here's, here's what else we need help with. The administrative buildings were built in 1943. 1943. We're spending a million dollars a year just trying to repair them. Um, and, and now that we've got the roof back, um, you can't run a facility this large and this sophisticated without smart people administrating, administering all the programs. And we, we just need some help there. Can you give us some help? Senator, thank you for asking that question. You're welcome. Because the help, I can plead to you, we need the help. Okay. You've probably got a half a billion dollars worth of infrastructure that you need at Michoud. Yeah. Throughout the agencies, 10 centers plus 10 facilities, we've got $5 billion of infrastructure needs. It took me every 
skill that I might possess to get $100 million for Virginia and Maryland for a bridge to the Wallops Island launch facility that was going to fall in the water and was going to render that launch center obsolete. And thank goodness that you all passed an emergency appropriation. Did we get the bridge done? Finally. Okay, now can we turn to the administration building at Mishu Assembly Facility? Senator, if you will appropriate it, I'll come. Oh, we, we'll appropriate. And I will, we will appropriate I will it. Deliver. But I just want to make sure, Mr. Administrator, that once we appropriate it, it's a priority for you. It absolutely is, okay. in $5 billion. Be and and let, me, let me just say how key Michoud is, because it's located next to water and waterways. Yep. And so when the un contract under Boeing puts together these big cores of this largest rocket, puts it on a barge, uh, engines as well, which eventually come from up in Senator Britt's uh, constituency, and they come down the Tin Tom waterway, and they come to New Orleans, and uh, they're assembled there uh, before they go to Mississippi to the Stennis, and they test these engines, and then they assemble all that together, and then on a barge, it goes to the Kennedy Space Center. Yes. It's critically located. Do you mind if I interrupt you? Because I'm going to run out of time. If I yes, could have please. another 30 seconds to talk to the director here. Mr. Director, in 15 seconds, tell me the purpose of EPSCOR. The purpose of EPSCOR is to ensure that we make the talent and ideas in all of those regions in our country that have not been given the chance to express in its okay. fullest form. Let me put it another way. We passed EPSCOR 44 years ago. The problem was that all this money that we were giving you, your agency, was being spent in 10 states. Congress said, we've got smart people all over America. Start spending some of the money in other states. 44 years later, you're still spending the money in 10 states. Mm -hmm. You're still doing it. Not four months, not 4.4 years, 44 years. And I appreciate you creating a new program, granted or grunted or whatever you call it, okay? When are you going to start doing what EBSCOR is supposed to do? So, uh, Senator, the, the way I can answer it is I come from a small state myself. So I understand the opportunities and the, the Yeah, potential. but I want you to answer my question. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to answer okay. your question. Don't, don't answer my question because the, the chair has been very fa uh, indulgent here. Yeah. Answer my question. When are you going to start it, doing what the statute says here? Senator, to it's do. already started. In fact, it's accelerating now. It's accelerating now, making sure that we are able to deliver on the EPSCO promises that we have made and the Chips and Science Act has even set targets which I believe that those targets should be exceeded, not even met. So I am deeply committed, the agency is deeply committed to ensuring, and there is metrics associated with that now, so you will see progress. So this situation- Well, we haven't seen progress in 44 years. I'm talking about now, Senator, moving forward. I am committed, as the director now, I'm committed to delivering on the progress. Okay, I'm, I thank you, Madam Chair, for the indulgence. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Administrator Nelson, it's certainly wonderful uh, to see you here uh, today. Uh, welcome back uh, to the Senate. Thank you, Madam Double Chair. Uh, I agree with just about everything my colleague said, except for the part where she criticized Republicans. But other than that, she did say some. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here. I just wanted to share a few general thoughts with you. I'm, I'm a, in, America, in America, you can believe what you want, but I'm a big believer in, in free will and responsibility. Um, 
a, a, a French philosopher of the last century, very famous, um, tough to read, but if you plow through, through his works, he, he had a lot to say, called Jean-Paul Sartre, said, to be is to act. Uh, he said, all we are is the sum of our actions. And so, uh, despite what we say, what you do is what you believe. And frankly, everything else is just cottage cheese. Now, in, in government, where you spend your money is what you believe. Forget the rhetoric. Look, follow the money. Follow the money. Um, I, I'm a big believer in using, and I think it is the answer to, to many, not just of the problems of the United States, but our neighbors' problems across the world, at least in terms of energy. I believe that we should use technology to, uh, to make all forms of energy more available, cheaper, and cleaner. All forms of energy. Uh, I support green energy. I support nuclear. I support hydroelectric energy. I support geothermal. I support oil and gas in terms of, um, of trying to provide for a cleaner environment. I think that it's worth pursuing geoengineering. Uh, and I say all of that because I, I look at your proposed budget, keeping in mind that, that uh, what you do is what you believe, and in government, where you spend your money is what you believe. Um, you're proposing that we increase funding for green energy by 38%. I support green energy. I think it's going to have to learn how to stand on its own two feet, but I support it. But uh, you only increase funding for fossil energy by 2%, and you actually cut nuclear energy funding by 12%. Now, p pull up that first slide for me. Here, I'm, I'll, I'll just hold it. This is from your website, okay? Nuclear power is the most reliable energy source, and it's not even close. And that's true, um, particularly in terms of capacity factor. Okay, so how come you're not funding it that way? How come? I, I mean, uh, th th these advanced small modular nuclear reactors have an enormous potential. And, and if I read this... Just this part of your website, I would say, wow, the, the department agrees. Um, but your, your proposal for funding falls millions and millions and millions of dollars short. LNG. Uh, LNG, you know what most countries do when they don't have natural gas? They use coal. They burn wood. Um, we should be encouraging LNG. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to hear today what you're doing to make to cut some of the red tape. But those are my general thoughts. I don't want to end on a negative note. Thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to your testimony. And I'm thinking about Senator Feinstein and, and Secretary Granholm. Um, I, I, uh, if they're listening now, well, if they're listening now, I'd tell them both to get a life. Okay, but if they, it, 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 but I, I just want them to know that I hope they're they're feeling better, and I look forward to seeing both of them back soon. Thank you, Madam thank, Chair. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Kennedy. I will now, um, Madam Chair, Mr. Secretary, thanks for being here. I want to tap your expertise for a moment. Uh, gi give me, um, uh, give me your best estimate, just an estimate I know, uh, of of. Uh, uh, how soon do you think the United States of America will be carbon neutral? So uh, I think 
according to the climate scientists around the world and certainly the cutting edge scientists that we need to rely on here in the U.S., we've got to get carbon neutral by 2050. And I'm very comfortable with that target, and I think that's the appropriate by 20, target. By 2050. Which is only 27 years. That is not a long time away. And, and how much will that cost? So the cost that I focus on even more is all the costs no, that the are going to happen cost. if we don't get our act together. How much will it cost to get us carbon neutral? It's going to cost trillions of dollars, and it'll cost tens of trillions of dollars if how, we don't get our act together. How many trillions? I don't have the estimate or the numbers in front of me. I've seen a variety of different estimates, but it's a large amount. Fundamentally transforming our energy economy tell me the is a big deal. You, tell me the estimates that you've seen. I don't have those numbers right on hand. So, so you're advocating that we become carbon neutral, but you don't know how much it's going to cost. So there's an awful lot of estimates out there. It depends yeah, on you're, technology you're the, improvement you're the and other kinds of things. You're the expert. I know, I know with how much it's going to cost. I know with the certainty of all the experts I've spoken about, it's cheaper to get our act together than it is to not get our act together on climate okay. change. Okay. Then tell me the cost versus orders of the magnitude. cost that we, if we don't do it. I think it's orders of magnitude different. If we I don't get that, our act together, you, it's you don't You don't have a cost? You want us to get there, but you can't tell the American taxpayer how much it's going to cost? Is that your testimony? It's going to save us money, and there's a lot of jobs. Well, how do we know if you don't know how much it's going to cost? Uh, I'd be happy to pull up the latest numbers that I've seen. How about $50 trillion? Dollars, is that right? It's going to cost trillions of dollars. There's no doubt about it. Okay. If we spend trillions of dollars and we achieve, I, some of your colleagues estimate $50 trillion, and it disappoints me that you're not willing to give the estimates. I, don't, I hope you're not telling me you have no idea how much it's going to cost. That creates a whole new host of problems. But, but uh, if it costs $50 trillion, as some of your colleagues have testified, to become carbon neutral by 2050, and I'm all for carbon neutrality, by the way, how much is that going to lower world temperatures? Or how much is that going to reduce the increase in world temperatures? So every country around the world needs to get its act together. Our emissions are about 13 percent of global emissions. Yeah, but if right you could now. answer my question, if we spend 50 trillion dollars to become carbon neutral in the United States of America by 2050, you're the Deputy Secretary of Energy. Give me your estimate of how much that is going to reduce world temperatures. So, so first of all, it's a net cost. Um, it's what. Uh, benefits we're having from getting our act together and reducing all of those climate benefits. We're seeing. Let me ask again. Maybe I'm being. Right now maybe I'm not being clear. If we spent fifty trillion dollars to become carbon neutral by two thousand and fifty in the United States of America, how how much is that going to reduce world temperatures? This is a global problem. So we need to reduce our emissions, and we need to do everything we can. How much, if we do our part, countries. is it going to reduce? So world we're temperatures? Per, we're thirteen percent of global emissions. You don't know, right do you? You don't know, do you? You can do the math. We need to. You don't know, do you, Mr. Secretary? So we're 13 percent of. If you know, emissions. why won't if you we tell went, me? If we went to zero, that would be 13 percent. You don't know, do you? You just want us to spend 50 trillion dollars, and you don't have the slightest idea whether it's going to reduce world temperatures. Now, I'm all for carbon neutrality, but you're the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Energy, and you're advocating we spend trillions of dollars to seek carbon neutrality, and you can't, and this isn't your money or my money, it's taxpayer money, and you can't tell me how much it's going to lower world temperatures? There, or you won't tell me? You know, but you won't? In my heart of hearts, there is no way the world gets its act together on climate change unless the U.S. leads. Tell me how much it's the going US to reduce. You, can, you can't tell me. Either that or you won't. We're 13%, and that's, 15 percent that, The President of the United emissions. States needs... I'm, I've still got a few seconds. I got 22 seconds. I'm going to use them a different way. Ms. Secretary, shaming you for not answering my questions. Um, Madam Administrator, how are we going to get plutonium pit production back on track? Well, th thanks, Senator Kennedy. We are doing. The, first, the most important thing we have to do to get pit production back on track is get craft workers in the facilities, finish our designs, get craft workers in the facilities, and that is happening. Uh, and so we, uh, we have got great confidence between changes we're making in our processes, 
uh, getting people on board, doing equipment pre-buys, particularly for glove boxes, which are limited manufacturers in the United States, uh, that we will be able to make pits. We're going to be late. We're trying to catch up. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Senator Heinrich. Secretary Turk, let me, uh, let me give this a try. What's the difference between living in a world with one degree? Um, there we go. By the way, I think NIH is, is an extraordinary institution. You and your colleagues, just your work is breathtaking. But I want to ask you about one of your programs, Doctor. In 2020, you created a, a program called the Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation. And, and basically, the, under the program, you gave 12 institutions $241 million, a lot of jack in anybody's book. Uh, and the, the, uh, you directed the, 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 the grant applicants uh, to use the money uh, to demonstrate a strong commitment to promoting diversity and inclusive excellence when you hire people, okay? And two of the, P the institutions to which you gave money, one was uh, University of South Carolina to hire faculty members in public health and nursing, and the other one was University of New Mexico to hire faculty members in neuroscience and data science, um, two great institutions. South Carolina and New Mexico issued rules to administer the money that you gave them, and they both said that we are going to punish candidates who apply for jobs with us with this money that you gave them who espouse, quote, rate, race neutrality. In other words, both of those institutions said, we're going to give a very low score for anyone who states, quote, an intention to ignore the varying backgrounds of their students and treat everyone the same. So, they took your money and they said, we're hiring faculty members and any applicant who says we, want to, we don't believe in, this, in racial prejudice, we think everybody ought to be treated the same, gets an F. Did you know that? I'm not familiar with the specifics um, that you are mentioning, um, Senator. Would you look into it? I, I, I certainly will. Um, this program is an important effort by NIH um, to create uh, a, a more highly diverse workforce. I agree with that. That's a good idea. I don't, and, do you know anybody against diversity? Uh, well, unfortunately, sir. I um, don't. I, I've run across a few over the years, but I'm sure there's some out there, but I think but, most fair-minded people agree with diversity. But, but, but our, our effort is, is to create an environment where people from all backgrounds, um, in, in every different dimension, would, will be safe and welcome to conduct high-quality biomedical research. I agree research. with that, but, but here's what I'm getting at. Do you think it's fair for the University of New Mexico and the University of South Carolina, two extraordinary schools, to say to an applicant who's borrowed hundreds of thousands of dollars to get her PhD and who comes forward and they say, how do you feel about race? And they say, I believe in racial equality. I believe everybody should be treated the same. They get an F. They're dismissed summarily. You think that's fair to do that with your money, Again, with taxpayer money? Again, sir, I can't speak to the specifics of, of these institutions, and I will look into it. Well, would, would, if it's true, do you support that? Again, I'd have to see what exactly it is. But if it's saying. true, do you support it? I, I, what we are trying to do, sir, is create inclusive environments because, unfortunately, uh, far too often uh, certain individuals um, do, do not succeed in obtaining 
faculty level positions at universities. But, but if I hire somebody, so, so suppose, can I as, as an American legally, constitutionally, morally say, I'm only going to hire Asian Americans. Anybody else of any different ethnic background need not apply. Is that, is that moral? Is that constitutional? Well, I'm, God knows I'm not a lawyer, but sir. Well, but you're a human to, being. To get, to get to a faculty level position is a multi-step process. And very often, highly qualified candidates are never even considered because of where they train, where they're from, or what they look yeah, like. Yeah, but do you think... You th and do none you of think, that is fair. You think, I don't think you're answering my question. Do, do you think... It, it, it's right for an institution using money that you gave them to say, if you believe in racial equality and you say you want to treat everybody the same, same, a big old hook comes out and at, around their neck and pulls them off the stage and they say, you're not going to be hired. Do you think that's right? I, I, I just don't, I would need to understand the context, sir, and I really don't know what these institutions are saying to candidates, and I will certainly find out. Well, I'm going to follow up. I want to know. Fair enough. I mean, that's how they spent taxpayer money that you gave them. Right. And I'm going to follow up, and I wish you would too. This disturbs me because I don't think that's lawful. We, we will certainly get back to you, sir, with what we find. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Britt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Administrator, um, the two cartels that are sending fentanyl into the United States are located in Mexico, aren't they? Yes, sir. And isn't it a fact that we could stop those cartels in their tracks if President Lopez Obrador would invite American military and or law enforcement personnel to come into Mexico and work with his military and law enforcement personnel? Senator, what I would say from my purview as the head of the DEA... It, but is my, is my statement true or not? What I would say is that we're focused on the two cartels um, who we believe are doing exactly what you say. They are responsible for the fentanyl coming. Let me ask you United again. If, if President Lopez Obrador invited the American military and or American law enforcement officials to come into Mexico to work with the same in Mexico, we could stop the cartels, could we not? Senator, I believe this is a, this is a whole of government effort and has to be, including whether it's the military, us, FBI, now, Madam, and others. Madam Administrator, I listen, I've listened to you here for almost an hour telling us how bad fentanyl is. Thank you for that, but we know. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask you a third time. If President Lopez Obrador invited American, the American military and our law enforcement personnel to come into Mexico and work with the same in Mexico, we could stop the cartels. Isn't that a fact? So, Senator, I can speak to the law enforcement side of this, um, and you just mentioned law enforcement. Uh, I believe that this is vital for both Mexico and the United States. Mexicans are, are dying as well, as we, as we showed in the Chapito. Well, case. then why don't we stop them? So we Would are, it help? Let me ask you a fourth time. Would it help if President Lopez Obrador... I don't think it's a complicated question, Madam Administrator. You're asking us for more money every year, more money, and it gets worse, worse, and worse. You, you know, in, in the real world, the nitty-gritty of the real world, when you fail, you get fired. In government, when you fail, you get more money because obviously you need it. Now, let me ask you a fourth time. If President Lopez Obrador... And I'd appreciate an answer. If President Lopez Obrador invited the American military and our law enforcement personnel to come into Mexico and work with his, we could stop the cartels, couldn't we? I believe, Senator, that we can stop the cartels. Okay. Have you made that suggestion to President Biden? If I could, I believe that we can stop the cartels by... Have you made that suggestion to President Biden? Senator, I have been very vocal in the whole of government setting on the importance of fentanyl and all of us using every single effort and authority that we Why have. hasn't President Biden done it? I mean, th this is the way the American people whose sons and daughters are dying look at it. Our economy is $23 trillion. 
Mexico's economy is $1.3 trillion. Ours is 18 times bigger. We buy $400 billion every year from Mexico. Without the people of America, Mexico, figuratively speaking, would be eating cat food out of a can and living in a tent behind an outback. So why don't you and the president, embarrassing no one, get on the phone and call President Lopez Obrador and make him a deal he can't refuse to allow our military and our law enforcement officials to go into Mexico and work with his to stop the cartels. Why don't you do that? Senator, what I am doing every single day is working with the incredible men and women of DEA who are risking their lives across 334 offices worldwide. And I appreciate that, but you're not, do, you're not doing what would work. Why won't you do what will work? Senator, we are- Why don't you call the president this afternoon and say, Mr. President, let's call, let's call President Lopez Obrador privately and make him a deal he can't refuse. Because we both know that President Lopez Obrador has neither the, the, the ability nor the will to stop the cartels. But yet we go along and pretend that they're our friends. And Mexico is our friend. But he has criminal organizations that are killing our people. And you know how to stop it. And the president does. And you're not doing it. Senator, we are working every day to stop it. And we but you're not doing what would stop it. We are transforming and we are working in countless ways across the globe to do what needs to be done for the American people. And there is nothing that you, the You know, when it's important to you, you make it happen. When it's not important to you, you make an excuse. And can do its job. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. General, welcome. Um, help, help me, I, I tried to listen carefully to my colleagues, but I'm still a little bit confused. Uh, you, you've been IG since 2011, and you do a lot of internal investigations. In other words, did some particular employee at the Fed not do their job? Is that correct? Yes. How, about how many of those you think you've done? Well, in terms of investigations of potential misconduct or wrongdoing, we have typically had uh, a running average of about 60 or 70 of those. Um, obviously, the pandemic. Is that total? 60 or 70 a year? No, at any point in time. Okay. Many of them are closed. New ones come in through our hotline, which we open up. But that's typically a rough uh, gauge for okay. how many investigations right. so we have pending. Since you've been there in 2011, again, I'm talking internal investigations. Would 500 sound right? I, I, I'd have to look into it. I don't want to give you enough. No, I'm there. not going to hold you to it. Was I mean, would, is it more? You think it's more than 500? I, I, I just I would I would like to look into it and get you an exact number. Okay. Um, in what percentage of the cases, just ballpark, do you do you find wrongdoing? Uh, again, I it would be a wild guess, and I'm not comfortable giving one to you. But we can certainly look into that and develop those numbers for you. Um, frankly, I, I would have thought you'd had it, would have that before you came today. Um, we think it's more than a half. Uh, no, I would not think so. More than a quarter. I, that's where I'm uncomfortable. Well, is it, is it happen frequently that you find wrongdoing or infrequently? It's not infrequent. It's not infrequent? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And when you find wrongdoing, um, are the people who committed the wrongdoing, according to your report, fired? Sometimes. Okay. What percentage are fired? Again, sir, I would like to get you a specific number if that's what you'd like. Yeah, I think if you could, could get us that number, and perhaps we could do this mm -hmm. again. Um, be, be, because I think people have the right to know that. I'm not, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to pick on the Federal Reserve. Um, I just 
want to treat them like everybody else. And, and my, my, my sense is, and I think your numbers can prove or disprove this, but my sense is that it is easier to divorce your spouse than get fired at the Federal Reserve. And if that's the case, well, we're entitled to know that. It's a lot of money over there. And that's not a criticism of anybody. And t tell me again about your, your salary. It's the average of what? It's the average of both the salary and the bonus that is attributed to the other individuals who are similarly situated in terms of the organizational structure, which for me is the division director level. So there are 12 uh, other individuals, and it's the average of their salary plus bonus. Okay. So there are about 13 of you, and, and your salary is set on the average of the 13. That is the case for all sure. DFEIGs. That's in the IG Act as the formula to be I'm used. just asking. Are the others set that way, too? The other DF the other, the, other uh, the 12 other ones whose salaries are used to get your salary? Uh, I, I'm not aware of how those are, set, okay. are established. Okay. And do you get a bonus? No, I do not. Okay. Do the others get a bonus? Yes. That's part of that average that I mentioned. Okay. Do all 12 of the others get a bonus? I, I'm not, I don't know the answer to that. Do they get a bonus when they say... Inflation is transitory and it's not. Do they still get their bonus? I, I don't have the answer to that. Okay. How do we get that information? Um, requested from the Federal Reserve folks. How about we call the IG? Can you get it for us? I, IG should not be in the position of getting information to turn over if we're not otherwise engaged in an audit or evaluation okay. or investigation. I know you're in the, pro if I could have one more, 30 more seconds. I know you're in the process of, uh, of looking at the bank failures. And, and I, don't, I don't want you to, I'm not trying to, tr trying to put you on the spot because you don't know yet. But, you know, I find, I find two things ironic. Maybe irony is the wrong, way, way, wrong word to use, but... As a result of these basically, ba these base, well, strike that. It seems that ever since the Great Recession, we've been very concerned, as we should be, about banks that are too big to fail. Big is dangerous. Um, I'm not against big. I'm against dumb. So... But if, some, if you have an institution that is really, really big and it does something dumb, it hurts a lot of people. Nobody ever goes to jail, but that's a separate story. Um, but it looks to me like, as a result of these recent failures, that our big banks are getting bigger. Mm -hmm. And I find that ironic. Again, maybe the wrong word. I don't know if you're going to look at that in your studies. Well, Senator, that strikes me as being a uh, straight-ahead policy issue. Mm -hmm. Board, the Federal Reserve Board decides what rules of engagement for the supervision of banks at different sizes, tailoring. And all of those are supervisory, policy-based decisions, it's, and, that's, it's, and the IGs it, are prohibited from really getting hard. involved in overseeing policy. Um, Senator Warren and I may disagree with this, but... Uh, we disagree a lot, but we still like each other. But see, if, if I ask Mr. Barr that question, I think the answer I'm going to get is, look, the problem with the bank failures is um, the, the management did, did dumb things, and they were incompetent. And, yes, yeah, some of my regulators were not as, as proactive as they should have been, but it's Trump's fault. Trump ain't my homework. And I don't think that's a candid assessment of the situation. The other thing that I, I find curious, and I'm going to ask Mr. Barr about this. Traditionally, when banks get in trouble, you don't go out and shout it. You know, we're in trouble. They call their regulators, say, we've got a problem here. Or the regulators spot it and they go in. And to prevent a bank run or panic, 
they handle it quietly. And the regulators will call around with other banks that are healthier and say, can we affect a marriage here? And that doesn't seem to be what's happening. And as a result, the healthy banks that would normally come in and help for a price, a fair price, and help the, the, the failed bank, the, 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 the healthy banks, they're pretty smart. They're waiting. They're going, no, we don't want to come in too early. Let's let them go under. And then we'll come in and we'll get a great deal and the taxpayers will have to guarantee all our potential losses. Can you look into that? Because if I ask Mr. Barr, God bless him, he's just going to say, it's the, it's the fault of the bank presidents and Trump ate my homework. So I'm looking for somebody who can help us answer those. To the extent that you're asking, Senator, about the process of uh, once a bank fails, what does the Fed, what does the FDIC do? Uh, in terms of trying to get another bank to come in and uh, take over or, mm -hmm. or buy its operations. Um, that would be kind of post-failure, so that wouldn't be part of our current review, material loss reviews, but we can consider looking into the kind of post-failure issues like that um, or discussions that may have been had with the other financial well, it, regulators. I'm taking too long, but here's what I'm getting to. And this is not a criticism of, of, of J.P. Morgan. Or, or Mr. Diamond, I have great respect for both of them. But you know the deal they made. It's a good deal. I'm not suggesting that, that they shouldn't have made a good deal for their shareholders. But the truth is, the deal was so good, if we still had white pages, you could open up the white pages, put your hand over your eyes, and pick a name and say, we're giving you this deal. And it would be successful. Because the taxpayers had to guarantee 80% of the losses. And somebody needs to look at that. Senator, I'd be happy to come up and talk to you further about that, have my team come up yeah, and discuss it with you I, and your staff and I'd see if to, there's a But I want to talk about it in front of the American people. Okay. Okay. Well, we can start by having a conversation in your office if you'd like. It's okay. up to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Kennedy, I want to follow up on something you... Uh, Senator Kennedy of Louisiana. I want to thank the chairman for this hearing. Um, yeah. It should not go unnoticed, though, that some of our banks in America under your supervision are hanging by a thread. Some of them have failed, and there are six of you, and we only have five minutes to talk to you. So I'm hoping our chairman will have another hearing and, and give us all more time. It also should not go unnoticed, it seems to me, it, I don't think it does to the American people, that when, uh, when someone in the federal government gets it wrong, no one is ever fired. I mean, I, 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 I listened to this testimony today, and I get the impression if, how can I put this? If Elizabeth Holmes worked for one of your agencies, she'd probably be getting a bonus. Um, Chairman Barr, for whom I have great respect, I have read your report. I've listened to your testimony. I have followed your remarks in the media. And, and here's what I hear you saying. Um, my people and I at my agency did not do a good job. And therefore, Congress should give us more money and power. Is that about right? Senator, I am not seeking any additional authority or power or money from this committee. But you're, you're going to promulgate new rules to give you and your people more power, are you not? We're going to use our existing authority to strengthen supervision and regulation 
to make it less likely that this kind of event happens in the future. I'm committed to, to fixing our system of supervision, making it more agile, making it more uh, forceful, making it quicker, and getting the right rules in place uh, so we have good rules of the road. I'm absolutely committed to getting that done. Okay, well, let me rephrase my question this. Here's what, then, here's what I hear you saying. My people and I did not do a good job and therefore, we're going to take the steps to make sure that we get more money and power. Is that more accurate? We're not asking for more money or more power. We're asking to. Uh, we're not asking really for anything. We're we're committing to getting our system of supervision and regulation right, and we'll do that now. Well, here's what else I hear you saying, uh, Mr. Chairman. I hear you saying, my people and I screwed up. But even though we're adults with free will and responsibility, it wasn't our fault because Trump ate our homework. I mean, I looked at your report. And to be more specific, Randy Quarles ate our homework. I mean, you said in your report you talked about Trump era changes, and you say those changes, quote, impeded effective supervision by reducing standards, increasing complexity, and promoting a less assertive supervisory approach, end quote. So I, I find your acceptance of responsibility in, in light of your report, to be a bit hollow. The way I read your report, let me say it again. You're saying, yep, we screwed up, but it's not our fault because Trump ate our homework. Is that about right? Senator, I, I disagree with that characterization. Uh, first of all, the report does not speak about any politician. Uh, Is Randy Quarles at fault? Uh, I accept full responsibility for our supervision and regulation at the you Federal didn't Reserve. did report. And the report does as well. The report no, is absolutely clear about that. No, it doesn't. We I accept just read responsibility. From your report. No, it doesn't. Did I read it wrong? I believe you did, sir. No, I didn't. Here it is, bigger than Dallas. Go back and read your own report. I yield back my four seconds, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Smith of. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Chair. And thank you all for being here. Um, Secretary Blinken, have you, uh, have you ever visited any of the 15 Pacific Island nation states? I have, yes. They're wonderful people, aren't they? Uh, I would agree. Um, and, and they have well-placed pride in their countries, do they not? They do. Right. Um, can, can we agree that these 15 independent um, Pacific Island nation states are just that? They're, they're independent countries. They're not just dots that some world leaders see out of their plane windows when they are traveling to meetings elsewhere? That, that is correct. Um, and can we agree that uh, that China is making a concerted effort to try to bring these independent countries within the ambit of the Communist Party of China? We can. Can we agree that America should have a deeper... Strike that. Let me rephrase that, Mr. Secretary. Putting China aside, do you, do you agree with me that um, it is the uh, prudent and moral thing to do to, uh, to have deeper engagement with our fellow countries in the, in, in the Pacific, particularly in terms of trade and investment? Very much so, Senator, yes. Would you support showing the 15 island, 15 Pacific Island nation states the respect and dignity that they deserve 
by creating an ambassadorship just for these 15 uh, Pacific Island nation states to be appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the United States Senate? Senator, something that we're, we're looking at, but let me just put this in context. As you rightly said, these are independent sovereign countries, which is exactly why uh, we have been uh, engaged in a very intense effort to actually get embassies and to have ambassadors in more of these countries. And as you know, right now, we've opened an embassy in the Solomon Islands. Uh, we've opened one in Tongo. Uh, we have one pending in Kiribati. Uh, and we're also doing the same thing in Vanuatu. So having these bilateral ambassadors is critical. As you also know, uh, President Mr. Biden. Mr. Mr. Secretary, can I interrupt you? Yeah, please. I'm really so sorry, but we, we have a limited time. Please. And, and I, I, I have followed the, uh, the, the efforts of the Biden administration in this regard. But what I'm talking about is appointing and not relying on, on other envoys or ambassadors. I'm talking about creating a new ambassadorship uh, for the 15 Pacific Island nation states appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, who would spend her or his time traveling to all of the hmm. island states talking about trade, investment, and listening. So, Senator, I'd say two things to that. One, I think it is important that we continue to engage these uh, countries independently, given their independence. Says, but to your point, and I agree, this is important, we have appoint, appointed a senior envoy to the Pacific Islands Forum. This is the main body, as you know, that brings all of these islands together. We appointed someone who's a deeply experienced but ambassador. But it's not who served. created in law, is it, Mr. Secretary? It's not. It's an appointment by the, by the Secretary of State. Okay. That's correct. So a new president could come in and say, we don't want to do this anymore. Could That's he, correct. Could she or he not? That is correct. What I'm talking about, if, if the Pacific Island countries are so important, and I think they are, and I think I've heard you mm -hmm. say they are, let me ask you again, would you support creating an ambassador Ambassador level status. I don't care what you call it, mm. but it wouldn't be an ambassador level status appointed by the president and confirmed by the United States Senate. What's wrong with that? I, I would just say, Senator, that first, the senior envoy that we have, who is a former ambassador to several of these countries, um, in effect, fulfills that, that function. Um, so that's important. But he's not an ambassador, he's appointed by a president. I'm talking about making this permanent. Why, well, why, why of course, a future president to... could decide not to appoint an ambassador at any given country. Well, but, but why that. wouldn't you want to? Why wouldn't you want to embed this in the law if and and give the Pacific Island countries the respect they deserve? I'd be happy to to pursue this with you. I think what we're hearing. I just from... happen to have a bill, Mr. Secretary. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm ha and very happy to look at it yeah, and come back to you on it. Would you? Uh, yes, I, I really you, think you that we have not given. I'm not criticizing you or your team. I, I, I just think that we haven't given th these countries the respect they deserve. And the best way to do that would be to give them a permanent ambassador. I think we should pursue this conversation because I'd really welcome doing that. What I'm- I'm gonna put you down as yep. a yes. <laughs> put you, to talk about it, absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Roseman Kindler. Uh, Madam Secretary, um, we're talking about restricting the American private sector from making investments in foreign countries in the interest of national security. Are we not? Senator, I, th I think you're asking about outbound uh, investment yes. restrictions. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yes, that is the okay. nature of And the sometimes... Reason. That may be necessary. Am I correct? I, I think that's correct, yes. Okay. Um, my question is, is the Biden administration doing the same thing for the foreign aid that it gives to foreign countries? For example, we're still, the Biden administration is giving over a billion dollars in foreign aid to South Africa, is it not? Senator, I, I, I'm sorry, I'd have to defer that to a different department. It, well, it are, are, we, are we reviewing that as to whether it's in the interest of national security? 
I, I'm sorry, Senator, that uh, we look at technology transfers and we are we are reviewing those carefully to determine. Yeah, but if we give them the money, they could use it to buy technology, correct? If it is restricted under our regulations, uh, I, I would say no, sir. Mm -hmm. Respectfully, we uh, our export controls are in place to restrict technology transfers, whether it's goods, software, or technical that. data. But, but, but we're still giving a lot of the Biden administration is still giving a lot of foreign aid. And what I'm asking is, is it reviewing that foreign aid w with the same national security standards that you're proposing to restrict the private sector? I'm sorry, Senator. I'm simply not in a position to answer that, but I'd be happy to take it back and continue yeah, if you, working with you we're, on that. We're, we, the Biden administration is still giving money to the Wuhan lab, is it not? I, I'm sorry, Senator. Uh, I, I focus on technology transfers. I'm not familiar. Do you with know that. if we're reviewing that money in the interest of national security? I, I do not. I'm sorry. Okay. Could you get me an answer for that one? Yes, we will find the right people to get to you. To get to you. Okay. Um, Secretary Rosenberg, in your opening comments, you said it's important that we maintain a relationship with China. So we can work together on, uh, on I believe you said climate change and debt relief. I thought you might have also said to contain the the uh, um, the threat of nuclear warfare, but that's just me. Um, I want to ask you about the debt relief. Um, many foreign countries owe debt that they can't pay back. Do they not? Uh, yes, Senator, that's true. And if I may, with respect to nuclear proliferation and its Yes, risks... ma'am, but I don't want to get off on nuclear proliferation because I'm going to run out of time. Um, and some of those countries that owe money that they can't pay back owe that money to the American people, either individually or as businesses. Is that correct? That... Uh, uh, I don't have particular responsibility over uh, foreign debt matters, although I do... Well, you mentioned it. Am I correct? I did mention it, and I do believe you are correct. While I don't have okay. specifics at my, at my disposal. I understand. And the Biden administration is leaning on these Americans to whom these foreign countries owe money to forgive that money. Is it not? Senator, I would be happy to follow up with you further on that, if I may, with respect yeah, to yeah, Chinese it, debt dependency. If you could just answer my question first. The Biden administration is leaning on American individuals and businesses to forgive debt to foreign countries, is it not? I would have to follow up with you with further information, which is I do it not. not? I unfortunately do not have an answer to that question. At oh, this time. you know the answer. You mentioned it in your opening remarks. It is. Unfortunately, Senator, I don't have an answer. You know what the Paris Club is? Senator, this is not my area of responsibility. You know what the Paris Club is? Yes, Senator. Well, the Biden administration is leaning on American businesses and individuals to forgive debt that foreign countries owe them, but China's refusing. Is it not? Senator, I would be very happy to follow up with you. You don't want to talk about that? Unfortunately, this is not my area of specific expertise. Yes, ma'am, but you, you're a smart person, and you mentioned it. I have a feeling you know about it. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to offer specific information at this time. You, you, you won't or you can't? I do not have at my disposal details of uh, that you're looking for right now, though I'd be very happy to follow but up. But am I right colleagues. that the Biden administration is leaning on the American people to forgive debt that, that, that foreign countries owe them while allowing China to skate? Senator, I, I believe I understand your question and the significance of it. Nevertheless, I'm not in a position to answer it with specificity at this time. You won't or you can't? I am not able to answer with specifics on this question, but I would be more than happy to follow up with you with my colleagues. In private? Certainly, I, I'm sure Don't that can be. Don't you think the public need to, needs to know this as well? I appreciate the point, and I wouldn't dispute that either. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to offer you Senator answers Kennedy, to those questions. Okay. Would you Kennedy, check Senator on the Kennedy, Wuhan Senator lab Kennedy. for me too? 
Senator I will Kennedy, say you can make that. you can make her answer as public as you would like once she answers you or someone at Treasury answers you. Um, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chopra, for being here. You just have a data breach at your agency, is that correct? And we have an insider threat that transferred on an unauthorized basis right. um, some emails to their personal email right. account. And, it, and you were in charge at, when this happened? Is of course, right? yes. Okay. And it, this wasn't an attack from with from outside your agency. It, it came from inside of your agency. Is that correct? That's right. Our systems were not penetrated. It was not a hack in that way, right. but we had an employee who worked for well, us did, who did, sent those emails. You, you um, the, the data for 256,000 consumers was breached. Is that correct? Yeah, we identi We looked through but the emails. But is my number correct? I, I believe that's right. Yes, but it was not their. Uh, it, it was not any social security number, birth dates, any of it that. It was their data, though, right? Uh, it was the institution's data, but it had their name, so that's important, and it's a huge problem. Yeah, it is. You didn't tell the customers that this happened to the consumers for two months. Is that correct? Well, we did not have the contact information for them, so we had to work with institutions to figure right. out who to contact, and we wanted to work. In partnership, but you didn't with them. tell them for two months. Well, is that correct? We have start. We started the notifications, I believe, last month. But again, we did not know the na the contact information for right. them. All we had was certain data elements, and we followed the cybersecurity OMB guidance to make sure well, you, that you we can understand. Can you not? Why consumers might be a little concerned about you having their information. Is that correct? Oh, of, of, of course. The right. issue of protecting personal data. Let me, ask you, let me, let me ask you about Section 1071, your rule on small business data collection. Under your proposed rule, you're, 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 when, a, when a bank loans money to a small business woman or a small businessman, um the bank, you would require the bank to ask that customer first about the, uh, you, you, the customer's race. Is that right? So uh, just to be clear, the, the proposal you reference, um, that has been changed since and has now into the final. The, the congressional requirement, and we are under don't, a court don't, order, don't, don't, requires don't, don't race. Don't filibuster me, Mr. No, it does so require just race. Just answer my questions, Okay. Is your rule going to require banks to ask the customer about their race? So th that, yes is in the, no. that is in the statute. And about their race? Or is your rule going to require the bank to ask the customer about their ethnicity? So just to be clear, in the sample form, it allows the borrower to self-identify or refuse. Just answer my question. No, I, I'm Mr. trying to Shelton. be clear. No, you're not. No, you're not. Your rule would would require a bank to ask the question of a small business person, what's your race? What's your ethnicity? What's your sexual preference? Are you gay? Are you a woman? Now that's that's you can you can bubble wrap this all you want, but that's what your rule does. Now the customer, particularly in a small town, is going to go, "Whoa, what's my sexual preference have to do with a loan?" And the customer can say, "I don't want to answer." But then the bank has got you're requiring the bank to tell you that they wouldn't answer, and all of this data is going to go to your agency. And we don't have the slightest idea how you're going to use it, except you say you're going to publish it. Well, we will not get any names but, at but, all. But, they, yeah, they, but you're going to have data sets so that it's, if it's possible. You, you can't tell me it's not possible to have this information known. Why do you want all this I don't. The, the, it, Why do you want to know what a small businesswoman's sexual preference is? 
Okay, that, that that's a mischaracterization. No, it's not. Of it. Yeah, it, it is. We no, have it's congressional not. objectives. No, it's not. We had to implement it. People can self-identify. There is no personal. Why do you want to know what a small businesswoman, let's say in a town of twenty thousand people, going to her local bank to borrow money? Why do you want to know what her sexual preference is? What business is that of yours? We. We sought to implement what the congressional what requirements are. What business is that of are. yours? What a, a small businesswoman does in her bedroom. Again, Who appointed you, Pope? Again, I, again people are able to self-identify if they wish You're to making use them. A pen. Uh, we are not making them. Yes, you are. No, we're not. And it's, if it's they very don't clearly. answer, the bank has got to tell you. And we have no idea how you're going to... We're go you're going to use this information. Well, I'm ha I'm, out of time. So, so I'm happy to make this Chopper, go about it further. The, director Chopra, I, I don't believe that's an. Director Chopra, please, us. Senator Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, Director Chopra, answer one more time, and then I turn it to um, Senator Warren Warner, who is on. Am I over, just like am I over again? Yeah, you're way over again, and I always let you, but I'm not going to let you go three minutes over with the same question eight times, Senator. Well, director if you'd Chopra. answer it, so director like Chopra. The homework, just like the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, there's other ways where there's requirements from Congress to collect data. In this situation, we took a lot of feedback to try and make it less intrusive, specifically based on the concern you're raising. There will not be individual consumer names sent. I will. Con we can talk further about it, but I, we tried our best to implement the congressional directive faithfully and, and, and consider all of these issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess my comments will be directed to Mr. Abate. Am I saying that right? Yes, Senator. And Mr. Olson, perhaps to all of you. Um, no fair-minded person can doubt the efficacy of, uh, of Section 702. Um, but here's the problem you've got. Just when the FBI, which I think... Um, which I think is, 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 is the most uh, effective law enforcement agency in all of human history. Just when the, but people are people, and just when the FBI is, has rebuilt itself after former Director Hoover, along comes Mr. Ray's predecessor, who clearly did not understand how to exercise power, either intelligently or maturely. He decides to investigate in a public way, not only one, but both candidates for president of the United States, and to do it publicly, and to leak like the Titanic. He, in, he investigates the Republican nominee with the flimsiest of evidence that has been manufactured that he, the FBI director at that time, d didn't even bother to, to, to examine. And then he turns to the Democratic nominee with respect to her email servers, investigates her, calls a press conference, says, well, I'm, I, I, not we, I am not going to prosecute her, but, but she needs to clean up her act. She's been negligent. And then a little time goes by, and he opens up the investigation again in a public way on the Democratic nominee and says, I'm opening this up. And a few days later, he closes it down. Might have cost her to the election. And then we start having reports, predictably, come out after that, the Durham report, the Mueller report, the Horowitz report. And it did extraordinary damage to the FBI and, frankly, to the Department of Justice. Now, Mr. Ray, um, 
who I supported to replace Mr. Comey, has said he has reformed the FBI. We just don't know how. We have no idea. I don't have any idea. I do know stuff keeps happening. I mean, one of your agents that was involved in the Mr. Hunter Biden's investigation um, goes on social media, apparently for a long period of time, and trashes all Republicans. He got fired only because Senator Grassley caught him. And all this hurts you. And it makes a fair-minded American look at this and go, whoa. You know, this is enormous power you have. And it can be used for gr the greater good, but it also can hurt people. And we've got to come up with a way to make sure that the right people are using this, th this, this law enforcement tool. A and that's, that's the problem you got, gentlemen. If, if I were you... Um, I'm not. I don't have your expertise, and I thank you all for your service. But if I were you, I'd try to be coming up with a way to con to suggest to Congress how you can check this power that you have so that the FBI and the Department of Justice and the other agencies can, 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 can regain their reputation. And tell us what you think. That doesn't mean we won't come with our own ideas. You know, uh, s senators don't take orders. Most of them barely take suggestions. But it would be helpful to me if you would come up with your own ideas to address these concerns, not just our concerns, but the concerns of the American people. I don't want to live in a country where if the FBI knocks on your door, the first thing you have to do is wonder whether the agent is a Republican or a Democrat. And, and thanks to Mr. Ray's predecessor, that's where we are, folks. I know that's a cold dish of truth, but I think that's the truth. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read your testimony. I need to learn more about this, but help us figure out this problem. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Chair Durbin has stepped out. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Durbin. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, welcome. It's always good to see you, Senator. I, have, I enjoy our times so in our private talks and in these hearing rooms. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, feeling is mutual. Mr. Chairman, why did, uh, did you and the SEC allow the FTX fraud to happen? The, the crypto field is often one that is commingling and bundling services, as I said earlier, and often also offshore. And uh, it is rife with abuses and fraud. Uh, it also takes time to thoughtfully and by the book and by the law build investigations and bring actions. Uh, there's a public figure on average about 23 months from start to, to either settlement or bringing an action at the SEC. Um, we, we did uh, bring actions over the course of uh, the last uh, five years on yeah, 150 the, companies or the token. cow was out the barn. I mean, he, I, I, I follow your, 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 your remarks, Mr. Chairman, because I have great respect for you. And you've said repeatedly before FTX blew up that the SEC has the authority to, rec, re, to uh, regulate cryptocurrency. Now, here you have this company, FTX, run by a young man who has more zeal than wisdom. He prides himself looking like the fourth runner-up in a John Belushi look-alike contest. He prides himself on being underdressed and overhaired reeks with arrogance, 
you could have sent down one investigator from the FTC with an ego like Mr. Bankman Freed and said, I want to send someone down for the F from the SEC and let them just watch you for a day. And he probably would have welcomed you in. I mean, his dad is, on a, is a chaired professor at Stanford Law School. Where was Stanford? But where was the where, where was the SEC? I mean, this was this was an accident waiting to happen, and I don't understand where the SEC was. So, sir, I would say that the whole field has hurt m more Americans than it should. Yeah, but I'm talking about and FTX. I mean, we look back at FTX. I mean, Senator Durbin made this point. And we, we, we have this elaborate, complex regulatory machinery, the SEC, which I support, which is supposed to guarantee transparency and combat fraud. And any fair-minded person has to look at FTX and Mr. Bankman Freed and these kids and go, what in God's, where, were, where was everybody? Where, where was the SEC? And, and I would say where we were, were is my predecessor and also under uh, my honor to be chair, we've brought 140 or 150 actions. There are 15 to 20,000 tokens and there are dozens of yeah, platforms. Yeah, but it was after the fact, and Gary. I mean, here's this, here's this young man. He, he, he did everything but buy Mount Rushmore. Didn't, weren't you all curious? Where's this guy getting this money? I, I, I would say that in the spring, summer of 2021 when we wells noticed a, a very large crypto exchange in the u.s they went on twitter and said that we were sketchy when we when we subpoenaed do kwan this is all public so i can say it when we subpoena, we gave him a subpoena he fought us in the district court he fought I, I, I us in the that, appellate court that, but but i'm not talking about how many lawyers can dance on the head of a pen i'm talking about why didn't you send somebody down? I guarantee you, with his ego, Mr. Bankman Freed would have welcomed you. Okay, he probably would have asked you to bring a film crew. Uh, you just send an investigator down, spend a half a day with these young people, come back, and go get an injunction. Shut them down until, until they can answer some very basic, fundamental questions. Like, for example, were they commingling funds? Why didn't we do that? Why didn't you do that? That's what we pay you folks to do. Well, I, I, again, I, I mean, I, I get all the Wells letter and all that. We've gotten we've got tens of thousands of people that lost a lot of money, and the, and they look they look at this young man and they go, how did the how did the regulatory authorities uh, regulatory authorities allow this guy to function? I mean, his Secret Service name is Butthead. That's how bad he is. Where was the SEC? And, and again, sir, I, I can't speak to one enforcement matter like that, but I, let me just broadly well, boy, say it's this, a big whole, this whole field, the whole crypto field is built on models that we wouldn't allow in traditional securities markets of commingling. The commingling that then you're why mentioning. Why did you allow FTX? And we've we've why done, did you allow we've, FTX? We've vigorously we investigate by the book. You, I'm sure, and the American public want us to follow the facts, follow the law, properly give people subpoenas. They get lawyered up. They give us replies. They do uh, effectively burn clock, and on average, it you takes could have gotten time. an injunction half a day. Mayor, welcome. You've been on the FCC for a while, haven't you? Um, you know what I'm talking about then when I refer to the C band. I do. And I, I bet do. you do. That's sort of the the part of the spectrum that. Uh, the companies that want to roll out 5G cell phone service really need. Am I right? It's mid-band airwaves that are like um, Gold Coast territory for right. wireless. Right. I'm going to call on the C-band. Um, you'll remember then in, in 2018, I certainly do, mm -hmm. um, 
not you, but some of your colleagues um, on the FCC decided uh, they were going to give the C-band away. My words, not yours. Uh, at the time, that C-band, we didn't know how important it was. It was licensed to some foreign satellite companies. That's right. And we discovered how valuable that, that C-band was. And the 5G telecommunication companies, mostly American companies, were really anxious to get it. Mm -hmm. And some members of the FCC and, frankly, some senators came up with a proposal to give that C-band to the foreign satellite companies and let them sell it to the 5G companies and keep the money. And I didn't like that, and neither did Senator Cantwell, and neither did Senator Schatz. And we called the president and insisted that, and, and, and the president called the FCC and said, we need to bid this out. Do you remember all that? I do, Senator. Yeah. Yeah. And we saved about $81 billion. Now, you've been auctioning the C-band out. You held an auction in September, did you not? Yes. Number 107, I think it's called. I believe that's right. Okay. The problem, we've got two problems here. Your authority to hold auctions has run out. Yes. And number two, more, more immediately, you conducted some auctions in September, um, awarded some licenses to the C-band based on auctions, highest bidder. That's right. Took that comp those companies' money, mm -hmm. and then your authority ran out. That's right. And the FCC hadn't given them the license. That's right. Why can't you give them the license? They paid for it. Oh, I agree with you. The situation's unfair. They paid for it. They deserve to have that license. So why can't you give it to them? So the Communications Act is very straightforward. It says our authority to grant licenses expired on March 9th of 2023. We've got a lot of laws before us that are tortured and confusing, but this is a straightforward provision. It expired. Okay. And so we're going to need your help getting what, rid of that expiration. What if we did two things? What if, number one, to solve the immediate problem, we passed a bill that said on a one-time, short-term basis, we're giving you, Madam Chair, and the FCC, the authority to go ahead and award those licenses that people have already paid for. That's the first bill. Second bill would be to renew your authority to hold auctions. Would you have any objection to us doing those two things? Sure. That we, uh, I don't object to you trying to be specific about the licenses in your first bill, but I want to emphasize how much we do need that authority back. All right. Tell, tell me, uh, I mean, this sounds very, very uh, simple when we talk about it here. Tell me, tell me who's pushing back on, on reauthorizing your authority to hold auctions. Well, that's happening in Congress. I certainly have uniform support among my colleagues at the FCC for getting auction well, who's, authority. Well, who's against it? It's my I'm not asking personalities. I'm asking <laughs> what interest groups are against it. Well, you know, the way that we auction Spectrum and have in the last several years, the C-band being an exception, is we frequently identify airwaves with federal users from the Department of Defense or the Department of Transportation. And we say, perhaps they could do the same function with a little less spectrum. And then we identify a way to take some of that spectrum, repurpose it for new commercial use. And then with the revenues from our auctions, we make the Defense Department or the Department of Transportation whole by giving them funds from the auction. So you're getting pushed back from, from the Defense Department and the Department of Transportation. Well, those are the two largest federal authorities with airwaves below six gigahertz. So I focused on them here. But the reality is we are putting more stuff in our skies for communication I know, than ever but, before. But we you can't say this, efficient. but I can. You're getting pushed back from defense and transportation. We've got a turf battle here. What, what can we do to sit down with DOD and, and transportation and the F FCC and work this out. We all we are all for national defense. Absolutely. We're also for 5G. So what can we do to get this worked out? Well, I could offer the services of my office and my whole agency to assist you.
because I want to make clear that when our commercial wireless economy grows, technology expands, and the U.S. does better. That's true. Well, if our chairman called a meeting board. and tried to get everybody together, would you come to it? I would. And would you bring your colleagues from I the would. FCC? Absolutely. Okay, we need to get this battle worked out. I agree with you. Thank you, Mr. Well, Chair. Uh, Senator Kennedy, before I turn it over to Senator Manchin, I, I say amen to everything you said, both in terms of making Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Morant, um, since President Biden's been president, uh, how many non-American citizens have come into our country illegally or on the basis of a claim of asylum? Thank you, Senator. Um, HSI as an investigative agency is... Uh, how, how, do you know the number? No, Senator. You're a senior member of Homeland Security, are you not? That's correct. Does anybody know the number? None of you know the number. Try 8 million. Now, of that 8 million, how many were children, Mr. Morant? I don't have that number. Senator. You don't know. Does anybody know? None of you know. Isn't that special? Let's assume half. Okay. Eight million is four Nebraskas. Right? Four new states. Let's assume, I don't think it's as high, half of them are children. How many, of the, how many of those 8 million people are still here? Do any of you know? Okay. Um, how, many, how many of those 8 million are claiming asylum? You don't know? How many of them claim asylum and don't show up for their hearing? Nobody knows? How many of them claim asylum, don't show up for the hearing, and President Biden has deported them? You don't know? How, how many of them have claimed asylum, shown up for their asylum hearing, and been denied asylum, and been deported? You don't know. How many of them were from Mexico? You don't know. How about 30%? That means 70% were not, right? Surely you know the answer to that. 30% minus 100% is 70%. Am I right? Okay. 30% came from Mexico. Why don't you implement a safe third country policy that says under asylum, under our asylum rules, you have to seek asylum in the first safe country. So if you come, say, from Venezuela or, or Nicaragua or, 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 or another Central American com country, you have to seek asylum in, your, in the first safe country. Why don't you do that? and then that would eliminate 70% of the 8 million. That's 5.6 million. Why don't you do that, Mr. Morant? Is that a question, sir? Yes. That's All beyond, I've been asking are questions. That's beyond the purview of HSI. Oh, okay. How about you, Mr. Salazar? You're a former advisor to the vice president. How come we don't do a safe third country agreement? Sir, we're working with our partners in the region. 21 countries signed on to the Los Angeles Declaration. Have you done a safe third country agreement? You've had, what have you been at it, two years? What we are doing is working with them to expand legal pathways. Why doesn't President Biden get up in the morning tomorrow and say, we're changing the asylum process and we're doing what most other countries do, safe third country policy. You have to seek asylum. We support asylum. We have to seek asylum in the first safe country. That would eliminate 5.6 million people, boom, done, coming into our country illegally, wouldn't it? 
Sir, I just want to point out Washington. Wouldn't it? It, it would, sir, but there are activities okay. underway. I'm, let me ask you this because I'm run, going to run out of time. President Biden and all of you believe in open borders, don't you? Don't you? I mean, I ask really basic questions. There are, I don't mean any disrespect. I appreciate you being here. And, and I know you all love our country as we all do. But I believe in straight answers. I like straight answers and breakfast food. And there are only one, two possibilities here. Either President Biden and his team believe in open borders or the people that the president has put in charge of the immigration policy for this country are not qualified to manage a food truck. And nobody's that incompetent. You, you folks believe in open borders, don't you? Sir, I think we believe in secure borders. You believe in no, then you don't even know how, well, I'm gonna take 30 more seconds. You don't even know how many people have come in illegally since President Biden has been president? You're a former senior advisor to the Vice President of the United States, Mr. Salazar. And you can't even give me a number? No, sir. That's like going to an oncologist and asking him, what's cancer? And he says, I don't know. Give me a break. Senator Welch. Uh, thank you. I thank the witnesses. Uh, you know, just uh, speaking to my friend, Senator Kennedy, uh, this you, Mr. Salazar, you're a former advisor to the vice president. How come we don't do a safe third country agreement? Sir, we're working with our partners in the region. 21 countries signed on to the Los Angeles Declaration. Have you done a safe third country agreement? You've had, what have you been at it, two years? What we are doing is working with them to expand legal pathways. Why doesn't President Biden get up in the morning tomorrow and say, we're changing the asylum process and we're doing what most other countries do, safe third country policy. You have to seek asylum. We support asylum. We have to seek asylum in the first safe country. That would eliminate 5.6 million people, boom, done, coming into our country illegally, wouldn't it? Sir, I just want to point out Washington. Wouldn't it? It, it would, sir, but there are activities okay. underway. I'm, let me ask you this, because I'm run, going to run out of time. President Biden and all of you believe in open borders, don't you? Don't you? I mean, I ask really basic questions. There are, I don't mean any disrespect. I appreciate you being here. And, and I know you all love our country as we all do. But I believe in straight answers. I like straight answers and breakfast food. And there are only one, two possibilities here. Either President Biden and his team believe in open borders or the people that the president has put in charge of the immigration policy for this country are not qualified to manage a food truck. And nobody's that incompetent. You, you folks believe in open borders, don't you? Sir, I think we believe in secure borders. You believe in no, then you don't even know how, well, I'm going to take 30 more seconds. You don't even know how many people have come in illegally since President Biden has been president? You're a former senior advisor to the vice president of the United States, Mr. Salazar. And you can't even give me a number? No, sir. That's like going to an oncologist and asking him, what's cancer? And he says, I don't know. Give me a break. Senator Welch. Candidate. Secretary Austin. Is it not true that the, um, the world is on fire in Ukraine the world is on fire in the Middle East and that there are embers smoldering in the Indo-Pacific. I, uh, I would say that it, uh, clearly there are challenges in both the places that you mentioned. And of course, in the Indo-Pacific, we see a China that's increasingly aggressive. Do you disagree with my statement? 
that the world is on fire, I, I would describe it a bit differently. I, I, I agree with your premise that, uh, that it's, it's as challenging is as we Is it not seen. true? I'm sorry to cut you off, but we only have limited time. Is it not true that uh, China, Russia, and Iran have worked between and among themselves to either start those fires, encourage those fires, or create those embers? I would say that uh, we see evidence of um, them uh, growing closer together uh, since the, uh, uh, the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, I, I would not, I, I didn't see evidence of China collaborating with Russia uh, to uh, uh, cause them to launch their invasion on its, on its neighbor. Is it not true that um, China, Russia, and Iran would like to see Russia dominate Central and Eastern Europe? I think uh, China would like to see the United States be unsuccessful. Uh, they would like to see Russia continue to challenge us and keep us uh, uh, you know, focused on that, uh, that area so that we'd have less time and energy and resources to focus. Well, the, the situation I just described, I appreciate you parsing your words, but the situation I just described would not disappoint China, Russia, or Iran, would it? it I, I'm certain that it wouldn't. Okay. Is it not true that China, Russia, and Iran would like to see Iran dominate the Middle East? I, cer I certainly believe that Iran would like to see Iran dominate the Middle well, East. Do you think that, that would, would break China's heart or Russia's heart to see Iran dominate the Middle East? I, I don't think uh, Russia or China would be unhappy about that. But uh, Is it not true that China, Iran, and Russia would like to see China dominate the Indo-Pacific? and be free to make moves in sub-Sahara Africa and South America. Is that not true? That, I think that is uh, certainly China's goal, to, to be the dominant uh, player in the, in the Indo-Pacific. And that is not a world safe for democracy, is it? It, it, it is not. It, uh, it's one that uh, would be uh, controlled by autocrats uh, eventually if... Uh, if they were to dominate the, uh, the Indo-Pacific and if Iran uh, dominated activities in the, in the Middle East. And if we did not stop them, strike that. Do you believe that weakness invites the wolves? I do. I think uh, deterrence, in order to deter, you have to, you have to uh, show strength. And... Um, if we do not meet these challenges now, do you believe it will be more expensive in terms of America blood and treasure to meet them later? I do. I do, Senator. All right, I've got one last question. Mr. Secretary, I'm looking at your and the President's proposed supplemental. What does $16 billion for child care $6.5 billion for the Federal Communications Commission to extend high-speed Internet and $3.1 billion for the FCC to reimburse telecommunication companies to replace insecure equipment have to do with the world challenges we're facing right now. And why did you make this request? I would defer to other colleagues on those specific aspects of the Do budget request. Do you support request. those? Uh, I support the, the supplemental budget request. Okay. Last question. Mr. Secretary, I appreciate your, uh, your candid answers, but why did the Department of Defense oppose my bill calling for a special inspector general in, uh, in Ukraine so we could follow every penny of American taxpayer money, given the fact 
that the Inspector General of the Department of Defense um, has never been able to audit his own department. Uh, the, the Inspector General of the of DOD has been involved in uh, in this effort from the very beginning. Oh, I know. And, believe me, he and uh, he opposed my bill, yeah, yeah, and I and, find that ironic because the Department of Defense is the only federal agency that has never, in the history of ever, been audited. But your Inspector General insisted that he be in charge. Do you not see the irony there with respect I, to Ukraine? Senator, I'm confident our, our Inspector General will do uh, a, a great job in, uh, in uh, making sure that, uh, we, that we remain on track with our responsibilities in, in Ukraine. In uh, Ukraine and uh, and uh, and Europe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Last question, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate your uh, your candid answers, but why did the Department of Defense oppose my bill calling for a special inspector general in uh, in Ukraine? so we could follow every penny of American taxpayer money, given the fact that the Inspector General of the Department of Defense um, has never been able to audit his own department. Uh, the, the Inspector General of, the, of DOD has been involved in, uh, in this effort from the very beginning. Oh, I know. And, believe me. He, and, uh, he opposed my bill. Yeah, yeah, and I and, find that ironic because the Department of Defense is the only federal agency that has never, in the history of ever, been audited. But your Inspector General insisted that he be in charge. Do you not see the irony there with respect I, to Ukraine? Senator, I'm confident our, our Inspector General will do uh, a, a great job in, uh, in uh, making sure that, uh, we, that we remain on track with our responsibilities in, in Ukraine. In uh, Ukraine and uh, and uh, and Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Mr. Secretary and Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, since President Biden has been president and since you have been secretary, how many members of Hamas have come into our country across the southern border? Uh, Senator, I'm not aware of a member of Hamas crossing the border. Um, have you stopped a member of Hamas from coming in? Senator, I am not aware of a, a member of Hamas being encountered at our southern border. Have you vetted all of the people who have, all of the 8.6, 8.4 million people who have come into our country illegally? Senator, you and I have spoken about this before. As you know, we screen and vet individuals. Have you, invented, we, have you vetted all of them? Senator, as you know, we screen and vet individuals whom we encounter. You haven't vetted all our, of them, have you? Senator, as I said, we screen and vet individuals whom we encounter okay. at our border. Right. I want to move on because with respect, Mr. Secretary, to quote a public official in my state, it takes you an hour and a half to watch 60 Minutes, and you try to filibuster us and use up our time. What is a safe third country policy? Senator, a safe third country policy is a policy that provides as follows, that when an individual is fleeing their country of origin by reason of fear of persecution, uh, and they traverse uh, a, another country that can provide them safety from that fear, then they may not qualify for humanitarian relief in their ultimate country of destination because okay. they Let have Let me stop you because you're watching 60 Minutes again. Um, well, it's Senator a safe third country policy, you can tell me if I misunderstand this, safe third country policy says America um, has joined the UN uh, treaty that says if you're being persecuted politically or for race or for, for religion in your own country, you can seek asylum in the United States. But this is the safe third country part. Uh, you have to seek that asylum in the first safe third country that you enter. Is that basically correct? Of the safe third country policy? 
Are you asking me, is that a correct yes, assessment? I am. Yes, but let me let me also okay. just let me ask you this, Mr. <laughs> Secretary. Uh, safe third country policies have been around for over 40 years, haven't they? I don't know that the, the they uh, started in the 1980s and in, in, in of all places, Scandinavia, didn't they? I don't know, Senator. Uh, and the UK has a safe third country policy, doesn't it? Senator, the, the, the UK um, is uh, underway in addressing its immigration Spain challenges. has a safe third country policy, doesn't it? Senator, if you, if you know the answer to the question, I'm not sure why you're posing it to me. Greece has a safe third country policy, doesn't it? I'm, I'm, because I want to know if you know. You don't even know how many people are coming into our country. That is Greece has a safe third country policy, doesn't it? Um, Senator, I, I disagree with uh, the statement that you... I understand, but does uh, Greece have a safe third country policy? Uh, I do not know if it does. Uh, Canada, the EU, Turkey, Norway, they have, all have safe third country policies, it's don't interesting, they? It's interesting you cite Canada because we negotiated, I negotiated the safe third country Yeah, and, 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 and the first thing that President Biden did, and you did, when you, uh, when, when you, when you took office was abolish our safe third country policies. Now, in 2023, this is Senator Hoven's chart, um, how many, what percentage of the illegal immigrants who came across the southern border were not from Mexico? Do you know? Uh, Senator, I know that um, third country nationals has been uh, on the increase, the number of encounters. What percentage? I can of, certainly, I can certainly. You don't know, do you? I can okay. certainly. It's 71 percent, okay, are not people who are not from Mexico. So if we had a safe third country policy, that means that 71% that, um, of the 8.4 million people that if you have allowed to come into our country illegally, let me be conservative and use 6.6 .6 million because the 8.4 includes gotaways. 71% of the 6.6 .6 million people that you have allowed into our country illegally would not be hurt in any way they could claim asylum from political or religious or racial persecution, but they would have to do it in another country, more than likely Mexico. Is that not the case? Senator, that is an incomplete and inaccurate accounting of the safe third And country. did you not say when we last spoke, and I proposed that, you thought it was a bad policy? Senator, uh, let me um, share with you a prerequisite to a third safe third country agreement, and that is... No, uh, that I'm out of, almost out of time, and I'm not going to let you filibuster, Mr. Secretary. Well, well Senator, I, I have to say that 60 I, I, minutes... Well, I'm just not going to let you Senator do it. Senator Kennedy, if he can re respond, well, you're out of time, but I, I'm, I'd like to... I'm, It's my time, Madam Chair, and I'm going to use it the your way I want. Your time is expired. Here, here's, here's... Well, you let others go on. Here's what I think, Mr. Secretary. I think you're a smart guy. Now, there are only tw one or two things going on here. Either you're not qualified to manage a Costco food court, or you believe in open borders. Senator and Kennedy, I think it's the Senator latter. Senator Kennedy, your time has expired. Thank you. I would just say the following two things. Number one, you're 0 for 2 on that. You're in inaccurate in both respects, number one. And I'd like the record to reflect that 60 minutes is not 45 minutes, because I can't seem to answer a question without being interrupted. I just wanted to make that comment. Well, if you would answer Senator a question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate the recognition. Uh, Senator Kennedy from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Grunberg, what the hell's going on at the FDIC? It's a troubling question, Senator. I read the report as you did. As I indicated earlier, it's, it is deeply disturbing and troubling and we're going to bring all the resources of the FDIC to bear to understand what is going on, what has occurred, and how we can most effectively address it. Have you ever, how long have you been at the FDIC? I joined the board as a member in August of 2005. Okay. Almost 20 years then, huh? Yes, sir. Have you ever sexually harassed an employee at no. the FDIC? No, sir. Apparently, you're the only one. Um, I mean, I just find this incredible. 
A former female employee recalled her male colleagues saying women needed to use sex to get ahead at the, at the FDIC as they stared at her. Did you read that? I did, Senator. Quote, according to one young woman, it was just an accepted part of the culture. One of the female examiners received a photo of a colleague's penis. During lunch with an examiner, another young female employee who had become friendly with this person she was having lunch with, the guy she was having lunch with complained to her about his marriage, telling her he wasn't having enough sex. And then he said to the young woman, obviously, if I walked into this office and you were naked, I'd F you right here. Did you read that? I did, Senator. Did you read the 200, the, the uh, 2020 Inspector General's report when it said that the people at the FDIC were acting like they were in Animal House or Porky's Revenge? Did you read that report? I, I read the Inspector General report. And what did you do about it? Well, I was not chairman at that time. There were 15 recommendations, if I may say, 15 recommendations in that report. And I believe the agency addressed all 15 of those. To what did you do about it personally? Were you, what was your position? position at I, the I was a member of the board at the time, but yeah, I was what not. did you do about it personally? At that time, I didn't have the responsibility of you the chairman. You didn't do anything, did you? Not at that time, Senator. Okay. No. Did any of your other fellow board members do anything? Uh, as a general matter, that falls to the chairman who's responsible for the day-to-day -day It was management. somebody else's problem, not yours. No, well, I was a member of the board to the extent that we were consulted, but in this matter, it's really a management you didn't issue. think you had a fiduciary obligation to to, uh, to to those young women and to the and to the organization and to the banks that put up the money? Well, certainly as a board, we had that obligation, but it really falls to the chairman um, to take the lead on this. Somebody things. else's fault. Well, that there was a I mean, chairman. That's what you're saying, isn't it, Mr. Chairman? No, I think the the board the Sounds board. Sounds to me like it. Well, not Senator, if I may say, it, board certainly has an oversight responsibility. But in the day-to-day -day management of the agency, which matters like this would fall to, I think it's reasonable to expect the chairman to take the lead. Well, when the banks last spring screwed up out in California, you blamed it on their board, didn't you? Mm, they, I think the, re, the, the report that was done on the failure found that the root cause of the issue was the management of the institution. Right. They also found accountability for the supervisors. The, the, the board was blameless. Like, is that right? Is that what you're saying? No, I think the agency... Kind of like the board at the FDIC, it's blameless? If I may say, Senator, I think we... The report found, and I think I would indicate that we shared responsibility as a supervisor. You and your colleagues ought to hide your head in a bag. This is no country for creepy old men. And they got no place at the FDIC. And this wasn't a news flash for you. You had a 2020 report and you sat on the board and you didn't do anything. And your colleagues didn't do anything. Mr. Barr, let me ask you about Basel 3 in game. I know you know this, about half of our credit now in America comes from non-banks. Uh, isn't your increase in capital requirements just going to make credit more expensive for banks and push people in the non-regulated, non-bank financial system? Uh, Senator, the capital increases mostly affect trading activity of banks and other non-lending activities of banks. The, with respect to credit, we expect the uh, proposal to have only a very modest uh, effect on the price of credit. For example, if all of the operational credit risk... You would and, stake your uh, reputation on that? I, I believe that the analysis is correct in the pr proposal to the rule. Okay, but if I could are, ask one more question, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay. But we're very open to comment okay. on the proposal. Sure. So if people have other analysis... Sure. that would help us make a better judgment about that, we're very open to it. The, the banks out west right. and, and elsewhere that went broke last spring, would this change have prevented that? The uh, banks that um, suffered losses uh, suffered losses pr primarily because of interest rate risk. 
It and this proposal, prevented. sorry, I'm if I may, sir. Senator off. Kennedy, uh, last question. This is if, it. if you could just answer my question. I'm, I'm, I'm my trying friend. to, sir. Yes, it would directly address that because for large banks, their interest rate risk would be brought into the capital role. Their unrealized losses and gains would be reflected in capital. So it does directly address the kind of risk that we saw. Senator okay. Menendez is recognized.